Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you uh, see a little link down below in YouTube, you can click on it and you'll get to Zoom. Click on that and you'll get to Mukana. And there, there you can ask questions and chat and uh, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, if you think you might be able to answer the questions, um, then you come in early, become part of the panel. We'd love to have you. Uh, the first hour is, you, can come, you need to be here by 640, raise your digital hand to join the panel. Uh, if you want to check your check your how you look, uh, you can come in as early as six. Um, and we're just chit chatting unless people ask to look at their kit. Um, and so, uh, so then we can sit there and, and see how you look and, and see how you sound. Um, and, um, uh, and I lost my train of thought. This is how it goes. I try to do this. I, I, I switched a couple things up and then I, and then I forgot what I was going to say. I'm very nervous that Chris is here. I'm excited. Chris is an old friend. <laughs> I think anyway, so, so anyway, um, uh, first hour of course is, uh, general questions and the, you know, you are the producers. So if you, uh, have something to ask, this is the time to ask it. Don't ask it at the end of the show. Cause it's very hard for us to manage. Ask it right now, right now. And that this will help drive uh, what, our, what our show is going to look like and how long we're going to spend on questions and so on and so forth. A second hour is something that we think is important. Something we want to spend a little more time on today. We have Chris Meyer. Uh, Chris is going to be talking about modular synthesizers and the music, uh, that, that whole uh, music genre. So we're really excited to have Chris. I'm really excited to have Chris uh, join us to talk about it. Um, tomorrow we have uh, AWS uh, part three. So we'll be talking about building uh, production capacity in, uh, in, in AWS. The first two have been amazing. So um, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Of course, Saturday we have education, uh, which is always a great conversation. Uh, just a bunch of educators talking about uh, edumacation in uh in the in the new way in the new world um and then we're also going to be doing our last week of resolve fair uh, we're looking at exports but you can really ask this is going to be our last uh week with it with uh with ripple training so you can pretty much ask anything uh around uh, resolve to um to uh, push that conversation forward and i think we're gonna do a little platform test we we have a platform that we were talking about earlier so uh, later in the morning we'll do that too and i'll put that into the um into the uh converse into the email tomorrow anyway Go ahead, Bill. Let's take it away. Okay. It's today, and Mickey comes up with the softball question. Are you ready? Uh, is today the day for the grandest, doubtful, loudest, maybe, and most chaotic, hopefully, birthday <laughs> song we've ever sung? <laughs> All right. So this is yesterday was the eve. It was our last, our 365th uh, uh, office hours. And I think we do have to get this out of the way. We're just sing ourselves a happy birthday. So it's just, so, uh, so anyway, we'll do this. If, if you're, if you're new to office hours, if you've come in recently, this is a, it's a tradition. It's kind of a, it's a horrible train wreck. Uh, we know it's a train wreck. You don't have to go into the comments and say, tell us how to fix it. It's, it we this know is, it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. That's, that's the, that's the beauty of it. All right. Ready? Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Us. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, 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 birthday of the hours. Happy birthday to you. Happy to us. So I do think eventually we, we, we I, I eventually we have to have people put their calendar in and then if they come up to the panel, if, especially if they're in the panel, we have to have a calendar of who, who we have to sing to. Because yeah. it is funny. It was it was fun when we did it with Hosmuk, especially because he had all the all the stuff all set up and ready to go. He had his whole family there too. Yeah, that was it was great. great. All right. All right. Next question. Moving on, Leo Mendel, actually not a question, but it's a kind of a sweet, uh, he says, not a question, an update. Google came back and have unblocked the synagogue tech channel. Thank you all for advice and input. Uh, lodging an appeal worked. So congratulations to our friend, Leo. Okay, first Another. real question. Oh, good. No, nothing. I won't say All right. Uh, Rupert McRae of Dallas, Texas said unions have been discussed before, but what other trade or professional memberships or subscriptions or even licenses have the panel found useful or not so? Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Well, you unions are useful, of course, if you want to work in, in the most of the major industries, because a lot of them are unionized, but I think it's professional organizations, uh, organizations like uh, SMPTE or, um, you know, the IEEE, those make sense. Um, and and it's, good, it's a good way to learn new stuff and uh, participate with your peers, you know. I mean, I think it's in, in some, in many cases, it's any, uh, 
any organization where you get to network <laughs> and talk to people. And I, and I, when I say network, I, I really am a firm believer of, uh, of networking by doing things together, you know, doing, you know, work, finding ways. And I think a lot of folks in office hours are, you know, finding ways to do that. The best way to know whether you get along with folks is being in the trenches with them, you know, and doing, you know, actually working with them and seeing what, what it's like under pressure. And um, I think that we're going to try to find more opportunities to do that here um, to just have people be able to learn from each other, but also learn how to work together and learn if they want to work together. Go ahead, JJ, and then Bill. I go IEEE and then NANOG, North American Network Operators Group, and Aaron. Those are kind of as far as being able to network, network. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little plus for something that everybody hates, and I agree that they're worthless in some circumstances, but that's certifications, and here's why. I found when I was trying to learn complex topics that if I did it on my own, which is the way I normally do it, just go out there, research things, pull in, I achieved usually what I call Swiss cheese learning, which is that I learned a lot of things well, but I had holes because I just had not stumbled into that area. So when I went to get software certifications, I was never doing that for an employer or an advancement. I was only doing it because a structured curriculum that took me step by step through all the parts of the software, even parts that I wasn't naturally interested in, really did give me more um, capability as an operator. I went to the places I wouldn't have naturally gone and it forced me to look at those places. So just for me and my expertise, I have found structured learning, whether that's certifications, classes, licenses, whatever you do, it can help a certain type of learner like me. Well, I think that, I think that one of the things that I, I find that those are much more useful after I've used it for a while, like learning a brand new one in a certification program, people go into this, I'm going to get certified in Final Cut, or I'm going to get certified in After Effects or, or whatever that is. Uh, it's so much more useful when you do it after you've been using it for a year. <laughs> you know, like, and, and so you have a comfort with the interface, you have a comfort with the process, and then we're going to go piece by piece and, and put it in. I think that you know the, the Resolve training has been an interesting experience where I, I feel like the just discussion may have not been the best way for us to do that. Um, I think that we, we got a lot, we, we've learned a lot and everyone got the videos and everything else. But I think that there is a, you know, figuring out ways that we watch the videos more together and also have more lab sessions to, to you know, kind of work through things and trade notes, um, I think is something that would be, uh, be useful. But yeah, I, I, I do agree with you that there is a organized of just making sure that you see everything. Um, I think there are other ways to learn that. And that's something that we'll play with here over time, over this year, over the next year <laughs> of, of office hours is doing lots of different projects that would just force you to go there, you know, go to those different parts of the app. So rather than going through something that's dry, do something where we're all doing it together and, and figure it out and maybe even have it be something that's new that we just shot for that, that piece. Um, to go back to certification, I think that there is, or organization, I think there's three things that you need to know about people that you're working with or that as you're trying to hire, you need to know what they're certified in. Like, what do, what do we know they know? You know, like that we've decided these things are important. I need you to be able to do these things. So you have to, certification becomes useful. I'm not really interested in someone saying they went through a certification course. That doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I wanna see them go at speed. So basically I wanna give them challenges that they can't do if they do it with a mouse. <laughs> like, like literally, like if you can't use the keyboard, if you can't use no, no every keystroke to, to, to do that, you can't actually get it done in time. That's what I want to see. Um, the second thing I want to know is uh, how many flight hours, you know, just how many times, you know, that we, we pay attention to that in pilots a lot because it's important. You know, there's just a, a certain number of hours that you put into it. And the third thing is how do you work with others? So 360 reviews of people, but those are the big three things that if you know those three things about a person, you can you can get a pretty good idea of what of what they're going to be able to do on your team, uh, Courtney, and then Chris. And once you've achieved your education and are a wizard in the field, uh, the organizations like SMPTE or IEEE are standard settings organizations, so you can actually participate and serve on on uh, you know groups that actually establish the standards for the industry. So you have a great yep. deal of input into the standards. So once you achieve that level, then you can really participate in, in shaping the future. You know? Yep, absolutely. Chris? Yeah, we had a person come in once who said that they were a graphic designer and went to college for that. So I gave them a bunch of work. I said, hey, cut these out, put them on a different background, adjust this and that. 
came back after lunch, uh, watching YouTube videos, try to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Well, um, and, and, and I think that there we're, we're going to see a lot of change in that area. Uh, Google is advertising it very heavily, but the grow with Google is the most just, I mean, I, I just predict that is the most disruptive thing to happen to education in a century. Like, like, you know, like the, the grow with Google is, is basically telling the schools you're not moving fast enough. We're going to do it for you, you know, and they are. Um, and so they're basically building certifications that you don't, they're like, no, when they say no experience necessary, what they're saying is no college necessary. They just can't say it that way. And Google, you know, has, you know, and so um, they are, but when you like, I'm, I'm going to be taking some of those UX courses just because I want to see how the courses work and the other ones look boring. Uh, anyway, so, so the, uh, because I'm really curious about how they structure the classes. Um, but, but that is incredibly disruptive for the employers to go to basically no longer wait for the uh, certifications and say, we're going to, we're going to develop a pipeline to work for us. You know, like that's, I mean, that's like, and remember that because they're doing it online, you can have, I've already seen comments from kids that are like 15 years old taking all those courses from Google, you know, and so it's a, it's a really interesting model that we'll probably see more people take. If Google's successful at it, we'll see a lot more of that. Next question. Rupert McRae of Dallas, Texas, the term REMI, R-E-M-I, seems to refer to the remote integration model for remote and at-home production. If this has been discussed before, I've missed it. Can the panel comment on the term's applicability? And then he has a link. Attached. Go ahead, uh, Jeff. This is what Jeff does. Go ahead, Jeff. Buttons. Yeah, that we've been doing that for a few years. Uh, it's nothing new, and and definitely in the last ten months, uh, well, year now, that uh, the the business has moved that away, uh, especially in sports. I was speaking with a, a truck owner yesterday, and they they have two trucks in their company. Both those trucks have only done full broadcast with full crew three times in the last year. Every other event they've done has all been Remy based, meaning that it's the engineer, the camera operators. That's the traditional model. Engineer, camera operators are on site. Everything else is done in a, a master control. Either most of them are not in the cloud yet, like we are, but there's a lot of locations that are just working in a central control model. And that's where Remy came in. Remy comes from the ESPN world, where uh, at home is uh, what Fox Sports is basically coined but it's definitely applicable. It's what we're doing. It's what we've been doing. Pac-12, Pac I think. Not, they're, so they're, they have been very hip busy they, with it. Wow. I mean, like for the last decade. Um, mm -hmm. But so, so the, the thing is Pac-12 is required to cover a lot of sports. Um, and they, so they still send trucks to the big football games and everything else, or they did. But they had to cover lots of other sports, um, you know, uh, that didn't have the same viewership as the football games. And so they they built this Remy model and they were doing, I think they do 2,200 games a year, Remy. And what that is, is they have specialized trucks that show up that literally have one engineer and the camera operators, just as Jeff said, that run, um, that run cameras out and audio. They get the, you know, scoreboard information. They also possibly have the commentators the commentators like to be there it's more of a yeah. social thing than it is a than a necessary thing so some of the commentators don't like to travel just do it from home or do it from the office or whatever anyway all of that be comes back over fiber back to san francisco um and uh it's incredible because they, they can pull all the resources it's all your resources it's not a truck that you have to rent that is different every time it shows up or, or slightly you know or that you only have this many you can you can have a ton of and i think in in their case it was uh, the dream dreamcasters instead of the EVSs, but tons of tons of those um, that are there, uh, and it's in a nice, cool location, and no one has to travel anywhere to to cover the events except for the folks that in the the small the small trucks that are dropping off the cameras. So it's it's a um, it's been going on for a long time, but as Jeff said, the last year has been explosive. I mean, it's just because everybody had to figure it out, and lots of new tools got built, and people realized. The big thing that's happening with with all of this over the last year is people realized that that was actually possible. Like people who thought that it was impossible got forced into a into a hole, just like our virtual events, got forced into a into a new window, and then was like, "This is horrible. This is horrible. Yeah, it's not that bad. Well, this might actually work." You know, that's that was kind of the transition. Go ahead, Courtney. 
and how far away are we from the major sporting venues installing permanent cameras and PTZ cameras and switcher and everything as it's, part of their installation? It's already done. done. You don't it's even already have done. to send the truck. So, yeah. Yeah. so the, the hard part is, is that um, I actually had a discussion with someone about that in a, at a, at a pretty large venue that, and what they found was, is that because every, because the technology is changing, as a venue, they didn't want to invest in the cameras, you know, like they didn't want to invest in those things. They wanted to, now some do, some have some cameras, they have five, 10 cameras that are available and the, and the venues have those. But if, a lot of times, like if you go to a basketball game, like they, they have for all their own stuff, they have a ton of cameras, but the broadcasters still bring in their cameras because it's a certain format. It's what they know. It's how they work. But because that technology is moving, they were like, what they did invest heavily in is fiber. So you know, the fiber, the, uh, all the routes for PL, all the ethernet, all the, some SDI, like all those things. Like, I mean, yeah, it's gorgeous fiber, uh, routes in some of these stadiums, the newer stadiums. Um, and so, so that's been really, really useful because it, it definitely takes a lot of the complexity out. It used to be, you have to run all this, you know, you'd have to run these huge, um, uh, SEMTI cables in and out of, in and out of these venues. And now, you just plug in on the outside. There's a huge, there's a server wall with a whole bunch of outputs. And you just, as a truck, you roll in and you plug into those. And then you plug the cameras in on the other side and it all just works. Um, Bill and then Chris. So I was surprised. Across my feed yesterday came Canon's new line of pan tilt zooms. And the top one for indoor and outdoor use is $22,500. So you can tell they're putting a lot of R&D mm -hmm. into the idea of remote pan tilt zoom. Their indoor ones are like in the $5,000 range. I couldn't believe that. I mean, I'm so excited about trying to test that that uh, Canon. I actually invited, I, he hasn't responded, but I invited the the rep for Canon um, to talk about that, that little PTZ, $5,000, one chip. Now one one inch chip log output. It's tasty, Chris. Yeah, I'm old enough to be able to say, in my opinion, you're not really a broadcaster until you've run a thousand feet of triax out to the outfield camera and realized you ran it the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but but I but I do think that 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 Remy is going to just keep getting bigger and. It lets you do, so we've been doing Remy for a decade, um, or I've, you know, I've been working on it uh, for a decade and, and at different levels. And it's just how we had to work because we were doing all these remote productions that were integrated. And what, what really gets interesting is when you start integrating multiple venues. So you have that, where the, the Remy gets more complicated when you say, I've got eight cameras in London and four cameras in Washington, DC and 12 cameras in LA. And then you make decisions in Remy, whether there's anybody there to switch those or whether whether you do them all you let the local crew and sometimes there's an advantage of having the local crew manage it because of bandwidth because of access because of a bunch of things but the, where we're going is that all those cameras are going to come back into the cloud and you're not gonna you're not you, you're, you're gonna manage them and, and even if you have three editors that are managing those things those editors will be all accessing it remotely go ahead joe that was exactly where i was headed uh it, it's all going to the cloud so that the central control mcr is based in the cloud and then mm -hmm. the operators could literally be wherever. I, right. we're, we're, we're basically proof of that happening right now. I've been working on a, a job in Dubai with a client and my, my shifted my whole day schedule. So I've been out the last few days. And that was that was really enlightening. It's like we could get the A-level. That's, that's the whole key about doing Remy is you could get the A-level people to work. Right. You don't have to settle on, oh, local hire. Well, that guy, could, the A-level couldn't make it. The B couldn't make it. The C couldn't make it. Well, okay, I found the guy at Home Depot. So he's going to be the audio now. And that's where we're, we're going to is we're going to get that A-level that can then do a show on Thursday. He doesn't have to travel. So he can do Friday and he can do Saturday and yep. then Sunday. So now we've got a consistency all the way across the board. That's the big advantage that Remy brings. It's not yep. just travel savings. It's about getting the right talent in the right spot. Yeah, I mean, we have we have we now are regularly having Brian Maddox for us still engineer our shows from his house in Savannah, <laughs> like and it, and it doesn't like there's not any you know there's not any reason to 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 bring him in anymore you know and and that's the that's the really fascinating thing and and for our group the exciting thing is that you don't have to feel like oh I'm in a remote location I couldn't do it you do have to have bandwidth. You know, low latency, high high quality bandwidth is 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 valuable, and I think that that's what hopefully mis municipalities will realize and start investing heavily in, or making it easier for people to get into it, or create laws that force people to either lower their prices and or increase their access to their polls. <laughs> anyway, next question. 
Mickey M here in the panel from the Philippines says, I have a studio build that requires three meter long desks with at least four columns of three to four units of desktop rack space. I usually have my studio furniture custom made, but does the panel have recommendations on good desks from which to get ideas and inspiration? So what are you trying to build, Mickey? Are, when you say three to four U desktop racks, are you talking about turrets? Like turrets Sorry, that are... Yeah, like where usually usually where you have a comps panels on. Yeah, so we would call them small monitors. Here, here we would tend to call them turrets. You know that that hang down into the um, uh, hang down into the into the piece. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Uh, so go. for the combination of utility and furniture grade, I have always looked at uh, Middle Atlantic for their designs. They're not the best in the world. They're not the worst, but it's not utilitarian. And you can get finishes like rosewood and shapes that are a little more interesting than just another rectangle. Now, you may not want that if you're looking for efficiency, but if you're looking for that combination of artsy furniture plus built-in racks, channels, and all the things you'd expect, they're a good, mm -hmm. good source. Go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say Middle Atlantic also. Uh, if you run a higher end, then look with a combination of 8020, which you can use the 8020 extrusion uh, to be able to build the frame part. And then you're just sticking the desktop on it. Uh, so there's some options there depending on the look you're going for and budget. Because some of the, the, like the ones built for, for MCRs, they get pricey. I mean, you could drop two or $3,000 just on a six foot desk. Yeah, hence, hence yeah. why uh, I, I usually get them custom made because like a two three thousand dollar desk mm -hmm. that I, I would see online, I can get it built here for an equivalent of 400, 500 US. And that's yeah, exactly mean, what we do for you our should trucks. go into we the furniture them. business, Mickey. Yeah, the the um uh we build almost almost every control room here that that does that has a backbone of eighty twenty. You know, like that is the, that is like the thing that now it's hard to get. I know that in India, it's hard to get at 80, 20, cause I had to order it. Um, uh, so it, it can be hard overseas, but, but here the, um, almost everybody, almost every control room you walk into, whether it's CNN or Fox or, or CBS or, or our studios are all built with a backbone of 80, 20, because it's super, um, customizable you're not buying your way into something that you're stuck with you you want to make the desk a little higher a little lower you want to move monitors around you want to you build a backbone of all of that with the 8020 and then you can constantly be adding and moving and, and adjusting things and it's super stiff you know so it's it's really it's really useful so um and then after that you're just putting the the turrets and everything else are usually designed we use a company in uh, i believe it's cleveland called uh, cabinet works and they, and, and they, um, I wish that they would just sell their designs because they, they make these, they're like, well, we don't design them for you to, to go have someone else make them, but I want to make them all over the world. And what, what's really good is the person that I work with there is so fast because when you work with someone who does it, they have it all in their CAD program. That's everything's all laid out and the designs and all the, there's a library and they just, and I've literally watched Brian make my, whatever I'm designing. And it's just, it's, you know, what he does in five minutes would take me three hours to like figure out, okay, you want this, you want this, and here you will put this turret in, or you want for you, you want this, and do you, how much do you want it tilted, and all those things become, so working with someone to design it is the key there. Go ahead, Carl. I found that Zoar is pretty good. So Zoar is, they have like heaps of different ranges, and they're like even like a, a three 19-inch rack um, desk, only about $1,000 US, so they're actually reasonably priced. So I found. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Courtney? Nobody's mentioned them yet, but back when I was designing control rooms and things, Winstead was the king of the hill for consoles and, and rack mount uh, desks. I guess they, they're still around there, aren't they? Yeah, they're still around and they're still charging a lot. They are expensive. They're the, you know, top. I mean, I usually, if I'm building a desk, usually I'm, I'm assuming that it's going to cost you know, eight to $10,000. That's usually how I kind of like, that's what in my head, that's kind of the world that I, you know, like when I'm designing one. But now one of the things that I design a lot is I don't make very long desks. I make desks that are, that can swing, you know, so basically they can swing out to be a long desk. There's something to think about when you're designing them is when I design desks, I have them so that they're, so that you can pull them around one person. So like, for instance, the audio, like if I want to have one person run an event, I can pull 
the the thing around. And what what that means again with eighty twenty is you put everything on wheels. You can move the whole desk around, but you can also swing the two arms around so that one person can easily get to audio and and to the participants or whatever. And then you swing it back if you have, or, or even pull them away apart from each other if you're going to have three different operators. So thinking about, you know, big desks tie you into a solution, whereas modular desks sometimes can give you a couple options of, of how to make that work. Um, Chris Fritchie. Yeah. Hey, for anybody on the panel, this is the type of work I did for over a decade. So if somebody needs help uh, cadding something out or drawings, just get with me. Uh, dangerous thing to say. All right. <laughs> Next question. Moving on, TJ Worrell of Minneapolis, Minnesota is up next with what's the best practice when allocating blocks when subnetting our internal network? Is it okay to fill a block or should there always be open addresses even if they will never be filled? If relevant, uh, talk about Dante, Zoom, ATEM, and Behringer controls, building this within our office network, and there's three of them. Waiting for JJ to raise his hand. Yeah, very good, JJ. So generally what I, what I do is I try to have some idea about, first of all, I, I, I create VLANs that have non-contiguous blocks and I usually leave like a 10 space. So if I start at whatever my, my base space would be, I'd say 192, 10.0, 20.0, 30.0, 40.0. And then you just match up your VLANs with those exact same subnets, making sure there's slash 24s usually, because you want to want to only have 256 addresses within that pool. Um, and then just use those everywhere. Um, and usually for me, my personal space at home is always 42. So one into one, six, eight, 42, cause I'm a nerd dot zero. Uh, and then because you've got that entire space, most devices out there, like if you, if you plug in an Apple or whatever, there, a lot of times we'll use the one, two, one, six, eight, one, or 10 dot, 10 dot zero dot 10 dot zero. Comcast also uses the 10 dot zero, zero, zero space. So staying away from that base pool. Um, that's the default on so many devices. <clears throat> um, that's, or if you have a large network, start with 172. So your su private subnets, just know where they are. And not all the 192.168 is private. So I think it's at 32 is when it's public. So don't <laughs> be sure and, that you know where your, where your privates are. And, and, oh, so and it's 128. And, gen and generally, you know, I definitely leave spaces. Like if I'm allocating groups of things to it, I always want to have, um, the general rule of production and everything else that I do is I want to be at about 40 to 50 percent, 60 percent maximum capacity. You know, like so, you know, like if, if, if I, you know, so as I build those out, I think about all the things I could do and then I add a little bit more to the top of it so that I can um, so that my chances of running out of, of headroom becomes lower because re reordering them is a pain in the neck. Uh, go ahead, JJ, and, real quick. And one more rule is that if you plan on having a larger space, make sure your, your subnets are divisible by four because you'll probably want to expand past that. So if you actually do plan on growing much larger, one into one, six, eight, eight would be where you'd start because you have zero through eight as those slash 24s you're going to use. And then again, 16. So make sure you're divisible by, by four or eight. That way you can expand larger, larger blocks, super netting. That's great. Next question. Jan Landy of Las Vegas is up next with uh, yesterday during the show, I upgraded my Mac to Zoom 560. When I minimized the screen, a little mini window, mini video window appeared. I cannot duplicate that. How did that happen? And how can I make it happen again? So what happened? You have a little mini window? Yeah, it was like a pop-up window appeared in on my computer and I can't get it to do it again. And, and it only happened in the webinar of yesterday. So if I click the minimize, you know, on the on a Mac, there are three buttons, a red, a yellow and a green. Oh, I, I just did it. I just clicked the yellow button. And now I have a little I have a mini uh, mini Jan. Yeah. Well, how'd you do yeah. that? I clicked I on the yellow. Whoa, whoa. And it's got little. Yeah, this is definitely new. Um, I click on the yellow button that has the minus in the upper on the Mac, at least the yellow button that, that has the little minus on it always is popping it into a little window. It's cute. Um, go ahead, Mickey. And I think it's been around for a while. I mean, that's how I okay. have mini Zoom here. Um, you have a while. little one? It's like a little little window? Yeah, the little, little window with a, what, you know, turn off camera. How do you get it back the way I just did it and my window completely oh, there's disappeared? A, there's like a, there's a circle with an arrow that, that goes off that you can- in Lower the, in, right in, in, hand. No, if your window yeah. completely disappeared, you got to right. go to Zoom up at the top and it says mm -hmm. meetings and then it'll, or it'll say um, exit minimal, minimal view. Yeah. Holy mess. I messed myself up. Oh, well, I'll figure Next it. question. 
Okay, the next question comes from James Babbitt in San Diego. Could Guy give more information about using the Rode Go 2 wireless microphone system? Hey, 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 can you hear me coming through it? Yeah. I didn't, okay, so that is, let me just confirm that. Oh, you're saying come up. Um, it's kind of buried right now. Uh, let me see if I can uh, put me on the And spot. what mic are you using with it? So this microphone is the Rode headset microphone. And let me check those levels. Basically, so it's, it's a little thinner than what we're used yeah. to. Okay. The, I could do a better demo when I actually get to dial this in. It was like a question coming up. And I'm like, <laughs> but anyways, it's two transmitters and a receiver. The receiver can be mono uh, left and right, or it could be stereo and 299 bucks for, for two that's mics. Great. So that's pretty crazy for 150 bucks a channel. Uh, there will be some delay though, because it's uh, it's a uh, Bluetooth or two, 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah. Uh, Jan and then Chris. I had a on? question in Makana about that as well. Uh, my question is, is, does it get powered? Can you plug it into the computer uh, with the USB? And does that keep the power going uh, on the receiver and on the transmitter? What's the battery life like? So now I'm coming through on the mix pre. You guys hear me? Uh, coming through better now? OK. So uh, the battery life is eight hours. And if you plug it directly into the computer, the receiver into the computer, it'll pop up as a device. So that was what you were hearing. I wish I could have tuned it better. But basically, what you were hearing was it direct into Zoom, no, nothing in between. So I took the mix pre out of the line and everything. So what you're hearing now is, is the mix pre again. Um, yeah, the nice thing is that you could plug it in an eighth inch uh, you know, microphone and get it closer. So I imagine it, it with a USB-C, it's USB-C, right? Correct. It's USB-C. And I just grabbed a quick cable because James kind of, thanks, James, throwing me a, a, <laughs> a, hard, a fast, hard and fastball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I, uh, yeah but basically it, it comes with a USB-A to USB-C cable. I think, I don't know if there's going to be a difference between a USB-C to USB-C because it's just an audio protocol, but it just pops up in Zoom as it's called uh, desktop audio desktop microphone wireless go to well, rx I'm, and i'm curious whether it'll it'll also show up it should show up in for our iphone as well like if you want to plug those two yeah. in you'd have a yeah just, just put it so in into USB the to device them, right? yeah yeah and then that's that's how small it is i don't know if it's focusing and then there's a mic on top so you, you don't have to buy a, an external microphone but it, i mean if you're going to get it this close it's going to look kind of kind of dorky to have this big old thing on you, especially if you put the windscreen on it. But if, if you need intelligible audio outdoors and you've got a wide shot, I mean, great solution for that kind of money. I mean, I'm used to spending 599 bucks per channel on a Sennheiser G4 system. So that's kind of been the standard in the industry, but these things, they're, they're getting popular. That's for sure. What's the range? About a football. We tested the previous version on a, on a football field and we got almost the whole football field. And so this new one's supposed to be about just a little bit more, like 5%, 10% is from mm -hmm. what, other, I haven't done it, but other people that tested it, uh, Caleb Pike tested it, and he got a little bit more out of it. That's great. Chris, and then we'll move on. Yeah, we picked up a couple of those uh, last week, and we're going to do some tests in the backyard as well. Um, we have a bike uh, park in our backyard, so we're going to be running those, and I'm just, I got to move everything out there to do it. We want to do it recorded, and we want to do it through Zoom just to see what happens, so I'll keep you guys posted on that too. Yeah, I, and I, I'd love I, to hear I, I, that. No, oh, we got we to keep moving. I, <laughs> next question. Jeff Hackett. Has, so for, for, the, for, the, for the, we got a lot of questions, so we're going to be moving fast. So when I, when I say we'll, we'll go to someone and then we're, and then we're going to go, then we're going to move on, that means that I'm not taking any more questions. All right, next question. Jeff Hackett of New Orleans says, when setting up multiple wireless mics, what's the best practice for frequency spacing and the minimum spacing? And he's working in the 470 to 517 uh, megahertz frequency spectrum group. Go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, it, it always depends on what system you're using and also how much uh, wattage you're, you're putting out of each transmitter. Um, 470 to, five, uh, to 517, that sounds like a Sennheiser G3, G4-ish. Um, and you would probably want to keep um, 96 kilohertz of spacing between channels. So 48 below and 48 above. Um, but it really depends on what exactly what system we're talking about. And Good. more than sorry, more than that, um, more important than spacing, you also want to calculate intermodulation, which is the interaction between two frequencies um, that that uh, collide in the air. If someone rem remembers, put free wireless frequencies into the second hour discussion, and I, I think we can pull some people in to talk about that. Um, it would be useful. Go ahead, Carl, and then we'll move on. 
So Mickey covered a lot of it. So um, essentially, if you've got a frequency range, of, let's say 400 megahertz, put one at one end and one at the other. If you have three, put one at one end, one at the other, one in the middle. So they're all essentially the furthest distance from each other. Next question. Mark Hadley of Seattle said, is it a good idea to paint a green wall instead of using a green screen? It'll actually be better if you do it really well. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so I had a green wall in here for a long time. It was 16 foot wide and I couldn't find any vinyl to get wider than nine feet. Plus the green screen paint that you can buy from Roscoe is a matte finish. So it's a lot more forgiving. And it was one of the best things I ever did. We're probably gonna end up painting this wall green again and leaving this other one black. But yes, it's the way to go. The green paint is about $100 a gallon though. And I highly recommend the Roscoe. Do not go to Lowe's. Do not well, try to match it because it, it has gloss in it. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll take your Roscoe and I'll raise you to composite components, which is a much better green than Roscoe is. How um, much is that one? About $140 a gallon. I'll, I'll try that one next then. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's uh, so uh, there's something in it. I think it's in the UV or something, but it keys better than Roscoe. And I, I can't figure out what, what they did. Um, to, to make that happen. It's the same green screen. They make the bell, the, vine, the, 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 the stretchy ones, the Lycra ones that I use as well. Um, the one thing to remember is, is when we've done a lot of green screens is that number one is you want to sand that wall incredibly well. Um, number two is we put usually, um, we'll put a, a base primer on and then we usually put two coats. We take the, we take the composite components green to Lowe's and we have them match it but we're that's we're using that as our primer to get rid of make sure that it's as close to the green that we want as possible so there's three coats on before we start putting on the expensive stuff and it's already mostly green at that point um you got to make sure there's plenty of you're just going to take time because you want to make sure it's really dry otherwise it'll crack um because you're putting so many so many layers on it um and then you know anyway so so you know that's the uh smoothness is really really important when you're doing a wall um, and so, and, and the way I look at it is I will take, to know how good my wall is for a green screen, uh, I will uh, bring it into a live view. And now I use composite components, but you can use other things and you crank up the contrast, you know, in the, in the green channel so that you'll see, you'll literally see the seams, even if it looks perfectly flat, you'll see the seams and all kinds of other stuff that that's there. Um, and so you want to try to get a, 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 as, rid of as much of it as possible but a green screen wall is always going to be better it's just permanent so so you just have it there you're kind of you're stuck with it there but if you're going to do something day over day over day and you can cover a larger space it's always going to work better than a stretched wall if you can if you have the space to do it uh, go ahead bill if you control your space, that's great. Remember, though, if you were in apartments or things like that, because I've seen people do this. And when I was in college, I painted one wall of my apartment black. That was a good way to lose a deposit immediately. It's really hard to cover black after that. Yeah, but, um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the thing, though, is that then lose the deposit. It's cheaper than and then constantly moving moving things around. I, I've done a lot of things that lost my deposit because I just decided when I did it that it was going to be a thing. We're going to move on because we're running out of time. Okay. Next Dan Huberary, Pennsylvania says, with the addition of an ATEM mini and second computer source, Raspberry Pi, Wacom tablets, Wacom tablets are, uh, and cables everywhere. Has there been a second hour on the best desks and management of all this equipment? We should, we should put that in, someone put that in the second hour and we'll, in Discord and we'll, 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 we'll make it a thing. Cause I think that, I think it'd be fun to warn everybody that we're going to do it and then do a, we do a show my setup in Discord, but I think it'd be fun to, like break it out and, and actually show, have us cut to the one, for those of us who have multi-camera, have us show what we, what, how we're using it. So um, let's, let's plan on doing that sooner than later. Uh, next question. Jan Great Landy, shot, Las Vegas uh, says, why as a panelist do we need to raise our physical hands to be recognized to answer a question rather than our digital hands? Uh, we're getting rid of the hand raising altogether in Makana. Eventually, we're we're now working on it to get to put it into the panelist area, um, so that the panelists have their own access and can do it remotely. Do it. The reason I don't like people put raising their hands in here is because it defeats my ability to um, move my panels around. So when, every time you raise a hand, you're basically making it very hard for a bunch of us that organize our keep on reorganizing our group. You can't move anything as soon as someone's raised their hand. Um, in the, in the system and it defeats the whole system. So I get, I get feisty <laughs> people do it. Cause I, what's happening for me is every time you, every time someone's talking, I'm dragging them near, nearer to my camera. So I do this all the time. Like while you're talking, I'm dragging you near my camera so that my eyes are looking more at you 
And so if someone raises their hand, I can't do that. And then I just get frustrated. All right, next question. Uh, Leo Mendel, these days off and a panelist out of London, says pre-show uh, Mickey and Jeffrey were testing Zoom host controlling the view for attendees. Can they try again so that we can check that out on YouTube? I don't know what you were testing. I think I was making breakfast. Yeah, that's not what we were testing. What we were testing was Mickey was co-host at the time and he couldn't switch back to the gallery view. He couldn't uh, do the control until he got host again. So that's basically what happened. So. Yeah. And um, I, Guy and I did a test earlier while the show was going on and he couldn't, as a co-host, uh, he couldn't switch it out either. Yeah, I think so, what we found is that co-host limits some possibilities and enables many others. So it's just been a change. But in is it new? Is it, but is it a new, new thing with 5.6? It, it looked like it, uh, it ahead, also Jeff. might be a PC and Mac, or Mac thing because as uh, I was co-host and I was able to switch. And I'm on PC, and uh, of course, and, and you're talking about switching your Mac. own view, not other people's view. You're talking about switching your own other view. people's views, yeah. Right. As a co-host, other, other people's views. Well, that shouldn't be possible. Well, it's not supposed to be. Oh, I guess we had that issue where we we were yeah, having we, that issue. Yeah, we were. We've been having that issue for quite for like a month or two. Um, and it, oh. it seems like it it kind of reverted back. Back, a uh, guy I believe is on a PC at the moment, and he wasn't able to switch either. Yeah, I'm on the PC and. A so if I if I'm in uh, gallery view now and I hit speaker view, does that change anything for anybody? I'm on speaker view right now. Can you switch to gallery? So now I'm on gallery. Did and it anything? hasn't switched. No, it hasn't switched. Okay. So it looks and I'm like looking the... at the my view. So the, in the pop up in the top right, it says my view, speaker view. So that's what I'm in now. If I go to an attendee view and I hit speaker view, what? It, um, that shouldn't do anything. But now if I go to gallery, what does that do? Yeah, that, that, that for sure for sure will change it. But the whole follow hosts view um, shouldn't be, it seems like it reverted back to uh, co-host not being to being it, able it to. It didn't uh, change it if he just changed it. it. We're still in speaker view. I just right? changed it to follow host view under my attendee view. So yeah, maybe, but if, I, seems, if I, you should if be I go and like, for instance, so anyway, so, so it, if, it appears, it appears oh, that yeah. it's, it's been, it, it appears that it might've been fixed on PC and on a Mac. Yep. I think that's, that's the point we're trying to make. All right. Next question. Uh, Michael J of New York city says, Hey, Alex, congrats. It's a, in a bonehead move. I trashed the needed file on my mix pre SD card. Any chance of getting it back? Um, uh, go ahead, Mickey. Uh, it depends what you mean by trash, uh, Michael. Cause if you just hit trash on the mix pre, it actually has a trash folder on the root, uh, root folder of the SD card. So you can pick it up from there. But if, if you mean trash, but like you deleted it on your computer, then you, you might be in bad shape. Good, Bill. Just a really quick rant about file recovery software. I think it's one of the worst areas of commercial software out there. So many of those programs lock you into something. They'll find things, but they won't let you recover them until you pay. And I just am really upset about those things. So find a good legitimate recovery program if you want to recover things off SD cards. Do a lot of research. Because man, they can be a, a mess. Does anyone have one that they like? I know that I've, I have, uh, I, I'm just trying to look at the one that I've used in the past. Go ahead, Ken. Ken, are you there? Um, yeah, Steve Gibson, um, his recovery is the only one to use. I don't think of anyone else. He is the master of it and his software for recovery. A problem is it's only for PCs presently. But um, right. yeah, that it, it is truly the only one to use. Yeah, I've I can't I can't I'm not sure which one that I've uh, I've used in the past, but I, I've definitely used a couple to pull off of SD cards. And the the big thing, the most important thing when you accidentally trash something is to immediately pull the SD card out and don't write anything to it because all it's it's just been flagged as invisible. But as soon as you start writing to it, it'll start writing over the sectors. And so it's super important to pull pull that thing out and, and until you have it, and then you put it into the recovery. Now it'll come out as garbly gook, and you have to dig through it to find your files. But um, but that that's the most important thing. If, if you've written to it again, you're probably not going to be able to get it back. Go ahead, Chris. I have a Wondershare, and I don't know. I, it's definitely a paid version. I don't mm -hmm. remember what it. You costs. should be paying for it. Like you yeah, should be paying for it. But it works like if, well, and it has a uh, like a more of a surface scan, and then the paid version has a deep scan. And I've had a lot of success with it. And I don't think it's more than a hundred bucks. I think it's a, just a standard kind of yeah. purchase thing. But you have you own the software forever, you know. So it's. And just use it over and over. Yeah, I would say that if you're paying less than 50 bucks for it, 
you're probably something I wouldn't trust it. Remember, you're, you're having something reading, writing to a drive that you're going to use. It's a great way to insert things. So just be really careful, uh, Mickey. Yeah, I think like it's an important lesson to to keep as as many as much uh, copies that your recorder uh, allows you to generate on site. Like the Mixpre allows you to keep a a USB flash drive plugged into the USB port, and after each take, it automatically copies the the recorded file onto the mm -hmm. flash drive. Uh, more higher end uh, recorders have multiple uh, SD cards and also built in SSDs to allow you to do multiple recordings at once. Okay. Next question. Moving on, uh, Jan Landy of Las Vegas is back again with yesterday. I believe Jeffrey took a group uh, alumni class photo of our first year. How can I get a copy of the photo? My version is already on Discord. I put it underneath. I think it's in the chat. It's in the uh, in the chat there. Someone put, I think uh, John Preto put the one from 325 up there and I put the one from yesterday right under it. So it's, 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 it's there. Jeffrey? $50,000 in unmarked bills. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, other than... Other than that, um, yeah, it's mine's no, on that's, Discord too, right? Right in the show notes. Yeah, and that's the charge to take it out, <laughs> take you out. Like you know, you, 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 that's the you know. You, to, to, if you look really bad, you want to get rid of the proof. If you want to get rid of the proof that you were here, you know, that's the that's the it's, charge. It's fifty to fifty four, and then fifty one if if somebody mm. wants to counter, and then it's auctioned from there. Yeah. Next question. Jan Landy's back again with does the Rode Wireless Go 2 receiver connect to your computer via USB? And if so, does that consistently power it? Also, what is the actual battery performance time of the transmitters? I think we talked through that. That was answer is yes in, in eight hours. Next question. Keenan Campbell, Princeton, Illinois, using the Blackmagic Design mini converters to take HDMI to SDI over a quad view HD. The second HDMI is going to SDI, then into HDMI out. TV is getting a strange click even when the audio is muted. Any ideas on SDI click? Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Bill and then Mickey. Every single time I've run into a click problem that has to do with audio, it's always come back to sample rate mismatches. Not guaranteeing that's it this time, but 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 out of 100 times, that seems to be where I finally find the problem. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Eddie Martinez of Sacramento says, where do people go for legal docs like contracts with customers outlining the services offered? Bake your own lawyer or uh, for cleaning up or something else? The place that I often start are the ones that people send me. <laughs> the bigger the company, the more I, the more I, uh, the more I, I look at them is because, you know, like NDAs and, and uh, contracts and so on and so forth. A lot of times they spent a lot of money figuring that out. And so I, I look through them. I don't usually use them verbatim, um, but I usually look at like for inspiration. I will almost always for a legal doc, have a lawyer look at it after we've written it. So we write it cause we know what we're looking at, but I make sure that a lawyer looks at it, um, looks at all the docs just to tell me that, oh, you might not want to say this one word or this opens up a bunch of things, that type of thing. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, we've been quite luck lucky that the, generally speaking, the sound community is quite open in terms of sharing um, the contracts that we send out to clients. So I've essentially taken contracts from, from others, mashed them together and see what works best for me and my clientele and have a law our lawyer check it um, in terms of, you know, how, if everything is kosher. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and if you, I think that's one of the best ways, as Mickey has said, is steal from your friends. Uh, if not, if you don't have friends that already have contracts, uh, LegalZoom, I think, has a large collection of uh, mm -hmm. uh, boilerplate contracts for mutual NDAs, unsecured demand promissory, let's say, letter of intent, employee NDAs, consulting services agreement, right. letter of, you know, tons of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Jan? Yeah, you're right um, um, about always taking it to a lawyer. But whenever I'm looking for something to bring to my lawyer and writing it, I'll do a Google search and you'll be amazed on how many different services there are with contracts out on the internet. Next question. Moving on to Chris Widener of Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, for temporary studios, that are, uh, what are people using that would be highly portable? Something like, and then he has 8020.net uh, listed there as a link. Uh, looking to build temporary dividers and video walls. Yeah, I. again, we, we probably could have somebody come on and talk about this, but when uh, when Marty Brennis, uh, who's, who's sometimes on here, uh, 
suggested 80 20 to me and wanted to build everything with 80 20 i was very like oh it just looks you know i don't know i don't know i don't think this is going to work and i've since been persuaded that it's an incredible platform um, especially when you're hacking through things or you're trying to figure it out it's not just for modular walls it's for pretty much anything that you want to build that has some stiffness to it that you want to figure out how to do it and you don't you're not ready to machine it you know like and and so um it's it, it there's i mean the there are very few catalogs that I keep in my house, like paper catalogs. The 8020 is one of them. You know, it's 8020, Granger. <laughs> this will tell you a lot about me. B&H, Sweetwater. Um, and uh, there's one more. Anyway, I have a couple of them. Uline. Usually laying around. Uh, Uline. Yeah, you, I love Uline. Anyway, so so the... Um, I, I I'm, but I'm the, I'm the kind of person... The one place I like going is Home Depot, just to wander around think about things that could be done with that thing. So anyway, um, uh, so uh, the 8020, I would get their catalog. I know it, it's using up some paper, but get their catalog is just fun to flick through and it's more fun than the web webpage. Uh, but there are so many options and I would highly recommend 8020 for almost anything that you think you're gonna take down and even things that you might leave up there for the, a decade. It's the right solution. I've never found another, I've found things that look like it. People say, oh, it's less expensive or it's, oh, it's this and that, but it's not. Does anyone have something that they think is better than 8020 for that? I mean, for heavier stuff, then you get into Hollander, you know, and, and speed rail, but between speed rail and, and 8020, I feel like you can kind of do everything, you know, go, everything that needs structure uh, that doesn't, it does not glued to the walls. And usually I'd rather have it on those than put it on the walls. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, not better at all necessarily, but uh, I helped my partner do a, a whole bookshelf with auto poles. And I don't know if that's pricey or if that's just a bad idea, but it worked for her. And mm -hmm. she's going to even use it as a room divider. This is a home thing. It's not a professional situation or public facing, but uh, it's, it's a cool look. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. I bet if, uh, if a store is closing or something like that and they're selling all their shelving and they do have 8020, you probably could get it for a pretty good discount there. You can definitely find 8020 in, in when, when anything closes down, you, you can look for auctions around it. The problem really is, is a lot of it's cut to fit. And so it's hard to get, you know, you'll end up in this weird cobbled together thing that it, and nothing's quite right. Um, where, you know, what really is cool is that when you work with someone or you, especially that can CAD it out that has all the, all the 8020 in the CAD, like as a library, they just pull, you have all the 8020, Chris, in the, in the, you have 8020 in the, in the library. Oh man, Chris. Chris, my new best friend. All right, so so anyway, so um, but building out, uh, you can very very quickly lay this stuff out, and then you get it cut to um to length. Um, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, the, auto poles are great. They are a little bit more expensive. Their big advantage of it is you stretch it out between two walls, lock the handle down, and it will stay there. I've had mine up, and I've got probably nine of them around me because um, I just need to be able to take this stuff down and not leave any marks behind. But it's a different thing than 8020. I think 8020 is way more flexible. Auto poles are, and I've got to be in, and then I've got to be out in three hours and leave no mark behind. Right. Um, next question. Thomas Bauer of Atlanta, what software is used for the video scopes showing on the grid and what is feeding into it? Another notch on our most frequent question, I think. Uh, which one is it? Which one is this? Is this a scope box? It is scope box. Uh, when it sees itself, it's not going to be accurate. I need to pin somebody. But yeah, it's basically just a scope box running on an old 20, 2013 Mac and I can choose waveform. You can lay these out however, however you want to uh, expand them make them bigger. Right now it's not showing anything because it's, again, it's seeing itself, but I could pin, pin somebody else. Um, let's see. They're muted. So if I pin, who wants to be pinned? Who's, who's a good example? We'll just yeah, pin Jeffrey. me and I'll mumble for a while. If you know what audio or something got, like that. I got Jeffrey. Let's see Jeffrey. how that works. Actually, it won't work now that it's spotlighted. I got to un, you'd have to unspotlight. Anyways, it's, it's basically waveform vector scope. RGB parade and uh, RGB histogram, and it gives us uh, real-time uh, data on uh, what's going on, whoever is active speaker or whoever is spotlighted. And right now, it looks like it just froze up because it's seeing itself too much. <laughs> I was going to show you a different one, but I I, I had a really good <laughs> setup here. I, I unplugged something. Uh, the other one that I've been experimenting with is one called Omniscope. Uh, by, it's Nob, Noob or nob n-o-b-e omni omniscope and um 
I'll screen share it. I, I didn't. I was going to be able to draw over it here in a second. If you can make me co-host for a second. Um, I think we talked about this in the past. Let's see here. This is... Um, So um, anyway, so you can see this here. And what's cool about this one is the, the modularity of it um, that I, is what I like about it. So of course, this is kind of the way I'm handling it right now. Um, you know, I've got a 3D cube that I can kind of see my color space in. Um, I've got my RGB parade. Um, so now I can also look at these and move them around. There's, you can just say, oh, I want a new something or other and throw it in there. Um, and, uh, and so, but I can also say, I don't, don't want to hide the menus. And now when you, when I have these menus kind of undone, um, I can move them around so I can grab this one, for instance, and pull it out. And if I want to put it somewhere, you can see it's, it's in this region. So it says, oh, you want to put them side by side, or do you want to put them, put this one and drop it in? And it stays as kind of a whole unit. And I've just been trialing it. As you can see, it's my three, I got three days left. I'm probably going to get it. Um, but, uh, it is, um, it's a pretty slick, uh, way to do it. And, and you can, you know, play around with the, how these, these work. Um, I do like Scopebox, and I've used Scopebox for years, so it's a good. They're both good. I don't think that they're any more accurate than the other, um, but it's just mostly deciding the Scopebox for the Mac, at least. Scopebox and uh, OmniScope is probably are probably the two best ones, and I think that Blackmagic actually makes one for the PC. Um, go ahead, Courtney. What's the cost of the license for the one you just showed? I think it's like eight hundred dollars, um, which seems like a lot of money, uh, and 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 Scopebox is like three hundred bucks. They both seem like a lot of money, but the hardware ones are a lot more. Like the the one we showed with AJA is twenty grand, so it's and it's great, and it's it's got more resolution and more tools, and you know for what we do, you need it. Um, but uh, the prices have come down a lot. Uh, go ahead, Chris, real quick. Okay, so on the Omni Scope, this is accessing anything that's video in. Yep, it just just grabs video in. And the way I usually have it set up, and I, I haven't set it up here because I'm just testing it, but I usually have a monitor that is whatever I'm passing into it always is showing it, you know, and, and you can make really quick decisions about it. I can put up a white card, for instance, and look at my RGB parade and know whether I'm hinting red or hinting green or, or whatever um, without having to trust my eyes. Um, next question. Marius von Zill of Johannesburg, South Africa is in with testing external USB mics and not hearing a massive difference versus my built-in Mac mic over Zoom. Is it worth the effort? Some settings I'm missing or something? Well, get within three inches of the mic and make a decision about whether it's better or not. If you're putting it somewhere on the other, you know, where your Mac mic was or the same distance, it's going to sound very close to the same thing. Um, you know, most mics want to be three to six inches away from from your mouth and I don't like 10 what is it 10 to 10 to 20 centimeters would that be about about right uh I, I'm not sure exactly how to how to break that down go ahead uh, Bill and then Jeffrey pretty quick most of the times we're listening for intelligibility so as long as you can hear somebody talking that's really the bar that you need to get over uh ear training is a thing for people who want to be more acute in terms of how you hear things that right. is true of music it's true yeah, of voice and everything sorry, I'm gonna else. Move, yeah. move quickly we're at the end of the hour I, I just I'm just trying to answer the question so so the the um uh we yeah, just get closer to the mic if you have it. You, let us know what mic you're actually using because some USB mics might not be that much different. Well, let's go to the next question. We just have very little time. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Has anyone had a good experience with doing auctions and bidding in a Zoom chat? I haven't, but man, does that sound like fun. I, I'll only do it if there's an auctioner, a, a pro professional auctioner out of Oklahoma. Like, like if I if I get a professional like cattle auctioner out of Oklahoma, I'm there. I'll, I'll buy whatever anyone someone wants to. Okay. We should bring someone in for a second hour for that. It's probably not really to the point, but it would be really fun. Um, it's like music to me. Anyway, I oh, we should do like a we should do a techno version of auctions. All right, next question. Todd Reynolds of North Adams, Massachusetts, our last regular question. May I ask for a recommendation from the panel on the best NAS network attached storage for backup, rebuild redundancy, and network access from a few different computers? Or does it even work for both at the same time? I need to understand the distinctions better. Any, any uh, it's probably storage solutions is probably a good solid second hour as well. Um, you know, I think that in, in a minute, we'd have a hard time, uh, you know, answering it well, but I think that we definitely need to back up and, and have some conversations about, uh, about, um, storage. Um, 
anyway, so we'll we'll get that. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, uh, eight dr- eight drive base or less synology. More than that, build your own. There you go. <laughs> synology is pretty good, and uh, so now we are uh, right on time. Uh, switching uh, switching gears, and welcome, Chris. Chris, I was trying to find there is for some reason. We're here with Chris Meyer. If you can resend, so it's on the top of my thing. For some reason, I cannot find emails from you, and I don't know why. There's something, are you, I don't know what it is. I was trying to pull up those images that you sent me, and uh, I'm not sure why they're not They're not showing up for me. Um, I just noticed that, that computer, during the hour. Yeah, that computer's in another room, unfortunately, but it looks oh, for emails okay, from well, Chris, at, well, Chris at Learning Modular. Maybe, maybe it's that. I. I am trying to... Anyway, we'll, 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 we'll get to those at the end. So we'll, we'll make it work here. So, um, so Chris and I have known each other for a long time. <laughs> I think I told the story for those of you who are, uh, uh, I had a panic. I told Lucasfilm that I knew how to use After Effects and, um, I didn't. And so I, so I, when I got the job, <laughs> because it was just, on, it was just, like, I knew how to use all the other things. It's just, that was the one that I listed that I didn't know. And, um, and then I got, I got the job at Lucasfilm and I had to show up useful. Um, and so I quickly rushed to, um, to LA and I don't know if, I think that's when we met, we might've met, I think we had met a couple times in passing at other events and NAB and other things. So Chris, I knew Chris and Trish and, and so that's how I, that's how we really got to know each other. I think though, I mean, that's when we got to talk and then we've, I used to come down and, uh, actually, um, hang out with Chris and Trish, uh, after, you know, I, I was on MGLA. I came down almost every month for quite some time and, um, got to spend a lot of time. So anyway, so, and so we've, we've known each other for a long time. Excited. I'm really excited to have Chris on. Um, and you've moved from, again, you, you, after effects was kind of a passing, I mean, that type of thing, cause you were really started in music, right? Yeah. Both Trish and I started careers in music and it became natural to want to do videos to go along with the music. And that's how we kind of migrated into the video and motion graphics field. And we did that for a couple of decades. But when we wound it up, um, we moved to New Mexico. Uh, Trish is spending most of her time being an artist these days. And I got back into doing music. Right. And and uh, you're doing, can you tell us a little bit about modular synth? Yeah, I'd like to give a kind of a condensed history of, of why these things exist. And yeah. uh, to be relevant to this show, also how people are actually trying to put on events with them, which is also kind of interesting. And yeah. it ties into something starting tomorrow, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, back in the 30s, 40s, composers had the idea that they wanted to use electronics to make music because you could hold a note indefinitely. It could be any pitch. It could be any tone. You didn't need a stupid human playing an instrument. But there weren't very many instruments to actually do this with. So they started stealing equipment, such as the electronic test equipment, oscillators, filters, bits of analog computing equipment, then cobbling it together to make a tone, filter the tone, change the loudness of the tone, record it to tape, and do that for every single note over and over again. And this was very laborious. Um, so in the early 60s, a few musicians, Herb Deutsch in New York and Ramon Sender and Morton Sabotnik in California, approached a couple of engineers, Bob Moog and Don Buchla, and said, can you take this mad collection of equipment that we have and condense it into something that's all the same format, it's in the same case, and it's designed for music, not for testing tube circuits and things like that? And that, in the early 60s, produced the first modular synthesizers. And the idea was each module handled a component of the sound. One module would be an oscillator, which would produce your tone with the various harmonic structure you might want. Another module may be a filter, which removed or emphasized certain harmonics to your taste. Another module may be an amplifier that made a note loud or soft, etc. And they're in one case, and you patch them together with these patch cords, and they look like a big telephone switchboard. Better which we can see behind me. Yeah, which you see behind me, a modern version of it. And we'll get to, to this lovely format now, because this, this is a crazy world right now. Um, these things were very cumbersome to use, and particularly to go take live. So eventually, manufacturers started pre-wiring those connections behind the front panel. Classic case is the uh, Moog Mini Moog, which Bob Moog was actually adamantly against because it would restrict your choices, but he gave in to musicians. Then they added microprocessor control, so you could actually memorize knob and switch settings, um, Sequential Prophet 5 being a classic example of that. Then they started using digital circuitry instead of analog circuitry to produce the sounds, Yamaha DX7 being a classic example. And once you could do it 
essentially in software, it wasn't long until they said, well, why can't we just do it in a computer rather than this big piece of hardware? So eventually you had software programs, then plugins for other pieces of software that were entire synthesizers running in code on the computer. Inevitably, those became apps that ran on phones and on tablets. And they came with hundreds or thousands of preset sounds, so you didn't even have to know how it worked. You could just pick a sound and go make music with it. And this worked out fine for a while till the early 90s, people said, you know, I kind of miss making my own sounds and maybe personalizing this a little bit. So Dieter Dopfer in Germany said, I'm going to start making modular synthesizers again. And everyone thought he was absolutely bonkers mad. But it took this exponential growth where he started, he made it a standardized format based on the Eurorack equipment format that was in Europe, published the spec so anyone else can make it to the same spec, very important. And then we had two manufacturers and seven manufacturers. And today we have literally hundreds of manufacturers creating these modules, tens of thousands of modules available from around the world, particularly Eastern Europe's gotten very strong at this. And those companies are like one to three person companies for the most part, very small, very boutique. They tend not to do assembly in house. They send it to China, or there's actually even manufacturers in the US who will make their competitors modules and even ship them for them and do fulfillment because they have all the assembly equipment. Well, the fun stuff about this is it's a lot more visually attractive than using a laptop or whatever to make music. So people got interested in doing these for live performances. And one nice thing about Dieter Dope for choosing this Eurorack format is that the modules were much smaller than the original big systems people used to use. So I have a portable version of this system that fits into the overhead bin of most US airlines that I go take and gig and play concerts and go jam with other people with. And quite a subculture had developed in the industry of local events happening on a monthly basis, annual events in Germany, Chicago, LA, where people come together, play music and talk about this stuff. And then the pandemic hit. And suddenly all these musicians had to adapt to streaming their concerts and performances. And initially it was, well, let's try to still do it live and switch people in and out. And that was a little funky. More and more people started pre-recording their concerts, getting nicer cameras, getting ATEM MIDIs, starting to care about lighting. So just using a webcam and one light in their bedroom. And now we have events that are grown to pretty large international scale. And probably the culmination of this is an event happening this weekend called SoundQuest Fest, soundquestfest.live. Three day event, musicians from all over the world, I'm one of them, interstitials of interviews with them, studio tours, et cetera, sponsorship. And that's gonna be a really large event um, headed up by Steve Roach, who was an electronic music pioneer. And it's a very interesting role that we found ourselves into where we're using modern versions of this old gear and now streaming it out around the world as part of concert performance. And this starts tomorrow, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. So there's the, there's the information there. I did find it <laughs> and uh, it's there and it's going to be live and free, I believe. Is that correct? Or is it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Free. So I have a feeling that that's going to be pl playing in my background most of the, most of the next couple of days. Um, pretty excited about that. And so th those are, and that's, but that's all coming in. There's everybody, that's a good, a virtual event. Do you think, what's the difference of doing that? I mean, in some ways doing it from home, if it, if it's done well, means that you don't have to move all your gear. It's made a huge difference. For example, I was limited by what I could fit into this case. I could fit into an overhead bin. Now I can use my entire studio, which includes this monster modular synthesizer, which is a centerpiece, but other keyboards and even hand percussion and things like that. People like Steve Roach says he's not going to be doing big tours now that he knows he can stream concerts. So we think a large part of the future is people continuing to stream events or hybrid events where there still will be some in-person performance. People who are into this are geeks. They love to interact with each other. Um, but then also streaming co concerts so you can have people from around the world beam in during a concert. Yeah, because the thing that I think is interesting is that in highly vertical markets where it's not a mass market type of thing, the online events become super powerful because you can collect people from wherever they are, not based on a geographic, not being limited by geographic reference. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like Denver would have a monthly event that was in a bar in Denver. You had to be physically there. And I played one of those events. Now it's people from, you know, any state or even internationally beaming in. It's a live performance event still. The Denver event you have to do live online, but now they're bringing people from the Netherlands, et cetera. And do, do is there a lot of collaboration between 
uh, musical artists at those events um, where they might be both, you know, integrated, integrated with each other and playing back and forth or playing as a, as a, as some, as a band. It's a surprisingly solitaire thing. People are used to doing this by themselves in their bedrooms. And I went up to Denver last year with Jim Coker, a friend of mine in Albuquerque nearby, and we played as a duo. And that was considered to be really different, very unusual for a duo to play together and people taking different musical roles. When I fly around and said, I'd like to jam with you. I'll take this part and you take that part. That was That's a foreign concept to a lot of electronic musicians. They're used to the, trying to do it all by themselves with their systems. Um, so, But more and more duos are starting to appear. And and the uh, is there any that's, is it all stereo? Does it, do you play it all with surround, um, you know, and that, that type of composition? I'd say electronic musicians... On the one hand, quadraphonic sound was a big thing back in the 60s when electronic music first appeared. Then it kind of fell out of use. And these musicians today are just now catching up with like, oh, we used to do everything mono because there's only one big speaker in the bar. And now let's do stereo for the webcast because people have their headphones on. People are interested in quad sound or multi-channel sound. One of the people I work with, Richard Bug in LA, does the multi-channel installations for Meyer Sound Labs. Whenever we play, he has several speakers around the room. But it's relatively rare at this point. I think it's going to become more popular. It would be really interesting to see um, what Dolby Atmos might do to that. Well, I'm, and I, I, the reason I bring it up is I spend a lot of time thinking about Dolby Atmos. <laughs> and uh, and uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that the difference between uh, mono and ste uh, mo stereo and, and Atmos is much larger than the difference between mono and stereo. Like once you get into that, and it feels like because everything's isolated and electronic, you know, it's not as much, you know, the hard part you have with Atmos or any kind of surround is um, all the instruments bleeding into each other. You know, there's only so much you can do with them because of that. Whereas when things are, you know, in things that are more electronic, oftentimes are much easier to move around because we can make them objects. We can, you know, they don't have to be just part of the bed, you know, that's yeah. There. And when I've experimented with Richard Bug on LA, we found that restraint was actually the bigger thing to try to learn. Like, it's very tempting to say, let's take all the parts and fly them around the room. But I might have like a stereo drummer and having the drummer rotating around the room quickly becomes disorienting. So we learn to take some tracks, nail them to the front of the room, and then take other tracks and move them and rotate them and offset them from each other around the room. Yeah, there's it, definitely consistency and figuring that out is is definitely important. The It, it is... Um, it, it's funny because now I, I've done a lot of it and I, and I listen to it and um, uh, I listen to a lot of the title stuff. I listen to almost everything that comes out in Atmos. And I, uh, I've gotten to the point now when I listen to music, especially older music, but I listen to music, I think about where I would put everything. You know, like, oh, I bet you I would put, you know, the, I was listening to Appalachian Spring the other day and I was thinking there's this little flute and I would be like, all this stuff should belong in the center and this would be in the side, but the little flute should be, it's like a little bird and it should just fly around, you know? And, and those are the kind of things that you, it's, it's the little touches that kind of create, um, create the space. It's by yeah. putting things in, in that, in that area. So it'd be, it'd be really interesting to see how. And there's going to be a learning curve for the musicians to figure out how to best present their material multi-channel. Like when I started doing stuff in stereo last year, people were like, whoa, you're using the stereo field, but now everyone does it. Um, I think the other thing we have to watch out for is, you know, there's a reason why things like quad did not necessarily catch on in the past, not just the room layout. Human beings are not used to having loud sounds appear from behind them. That kind of unnerves them a little bit. So we're gonna have to really learn how to, to use this medium. On the other hand, I talked to some record labels recently because I just released a new album this week. Um, and he said, labels are gonna start insisting that musicians deliver everything as multi-track stems instead of a stereo master so that they can take the multi-track stems and create an Atmos version of it. And this is the new album here. This is we we only came to dream. Yes. Yeah. So and um and th and what was this? Give us a little background on this. And this album was just just released, right? Yeah, I just released this Tuesday. Um, it's up on Bandcamp now, and it's not going out to the streaming services. It's on Apple Music, etc. And it's great that an independent person can do that. This was a collection of performances that started as live performances that I did for these various beam in shows for this past year. Um, and, October Skies out of Denver, a show up in San Francisco, and actually my set that I'm going to be doing this weekend. Then enhance them with a bit of studio overdubs and recording and better mixing and things like that. So we've got questions coming in. We're going to go ahead and jump to them. Uh, Bill, let's, what's, what, what are we, what are we, what are the, uh, now I, let's keep one. it. Yeah, perfect. 
First one comes in from Brian Anderson, uh, our own composer and arranger from the Office Hours Band at Silver Springs, Maryland. Uh, you were involved in the creation of the MIDI, or were you involved in the creation of the MIDI 2.0 spec? And if so, what are your thoughts about it? I was not part of MIDI 2.0. I was technical chairman of MIDI during a long part of MIDI 1.0 and added quite a few things to the spec, but I was not part of 2.0. The main focus of 2.0 is adding um, a multiple expression where each individual finger can be in a different position on the key, et cetera, and you can transmit all that information to a synthesizer and have it interpret that. And I think that's going to be great. Um, performing electronic music is something that people need to work on. They're very used to the idea of just hitting switches and not necessarily wringing life out of a note like an acoustic musician is used to. And I think that's a field for growth for electronic musicians. So it's going to make that easier to do. Next question. Thomas Bauer in Atlanta, Georgia. Anyone get a chance to use the recent run of the new ARP 2600? And there's a reverb.com link to the reissue. Um, I've not personally used one. I know a lot of people have got them. They're happy because they you know, lost or gave up theirs in the 70s and finally got their unit back. A couple of manufacturers are doing clones. DIY, building your own modules, is a large part of this scene today. There's actually been a DIY version of the 2600 available for a few years now. And what what does it take to, to build your own? <laughs> the, the, we're a DIY group. <laughs> so. In, increasingly good eyesight, <laughs> because the, the old things were all these larger through-hole components that you stuck into the circuit board. Now things are surface mount, and that's difficult to do. You know, you need a steady hand, you need magnifying glasses, there's a limit to how small of a component a human can do. You know, robots are better at doing stuff. And the modules tend to be rated in terms of degrees of difficulty of how hard they are to assemble. But a good soldering station, a magnifying glass, and um, you're off to the races. Good, uh, Carl. So I recently just received my 2600. Um, I sat on it for two days, and I just recorded everything at the highest quality I could. Because if you change one thing on a 2600, we never get it back. It's completely manual, it's completely analog, and just moving the filter literally 50 microns will change the sound completely. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the funny thing. That's that's part of the, the stigma of modular synthesizers, that you can never create the same sound twice, you can never go back to where you were. And that's why I actually teach courses in modular synthesis, because once you understand how these machines work on the inside, then it's easier to replicate a sound you may have created before. A lot of people learn these just by randomly setting knobs in different positions, they don't know how they got there. They don't know how to get back there again. So I've been focusing on teaching courses in this stuff the last few years to train people to realize, take the sounds in your head and translate them to the different settings on the device. And and, and those courses are mostly with the, the physical devices, not, not so much the software replication of those on iPads and so on and so forth. My main courses have been for the physical devices. I have done a virtual one. I have done a so-called semi-modular, a little Moog Mother 32, but the popularity is definitely in the physical devices. I was joking earlier during the warm up, you know, this is the ultimate multi touch UI. <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, next, next question. John Preto in Las Vegas is in next with Chris. Do you know the guys over at Cherry Audio that make the virtual eight voice and other virtual modular consoles? Are any of the software based systems a match for the analog equivalents? I've heard of folks at Cherry, don't know them personally, and people are indeed starting to do hybrid systems where some things are running on the computer and some things are physical. What they need is an audio interface that passes DC. It doesn't roll off things below audibility. So the pure voltage levels can be sent from the computer to control the synthesizer and the synthesizer can be packed back into the computer. And a lot of people are doing hybrid systems that way. Uh, next question. Thomas Bauer in Atlanta, Georgia. What do you use for generating graphics to go along with the music? You used to use white cap, any others? People are taking a variety of solutions, including plugins for OBS is, are quite popular in this particular scene. I, a lot of people just use laser projectors in their rooms. They have pretty lights flying around the room. Um, since I do have a video background, I'm one of the people who have been using you know, two 4K cameras set up in the room. And then in post, I do a lot of panning around on those large frame shots and then add the colorization and things like that in post. Um, one of the nice things about this event coming up this weekend is there are sets of strictly visual artists, and that will be particularly interesting. The last set each night, I believe, is a visual artist. What is the process? Oh, have... oh go ahead. One more quick thing. There are actually video synthesizers in this format. There are people doing video synthesis with modules as well. What is used to... If you want to make the 
the graphics be reactive to the to the music? What kind of software do you use for that? Is that where the OBS plugins are, are, are being used? It's where the OBS plugins are being used, but also you just need something that can follow the level of an audio signal and then translate that into a changing parameter such as color, hue, replication of a shape, size of a shape. I did a little gig in LA about a year and a half ago where we actually had a laser projectionist and I sent him my main beat so he could synchronize his own clocked events with my beat. And I was also sending him my audio signal that he then used to go ahead and change the shapes of objects in response to my sound. And are you able to multi, like, uh, send out multi-track so that you could have different objects and different, different pieces of graphics being affected by an isolated track as opposed to a mixed track? Definitely is possible. Um, it's obviously much easier to do a stereo mix and send that. But in this particular system, I've got 12 channels of audio coming out of it to mixer and audio interface off camera, off to the side there. So I'm definitely multi-tracking and it, that is possible. Now go ahead, Carl. Yeah, so Roland had a thing called V-Link, which was they wanted to integrate video into the audio pr platform. Um, they haven't really done much with V-Link since the early 2000s. But you can check out on eBay, you can see all these different modules that were, yeah, so you could send drums into one module and uh, melody into another module, and you're designed for massive projectors in the live space. So instead of lighting, they wanted, they wanted video projectors. But yeah, Roland had a lot of, a big system that did that. Yeah, that's one of my legacies. I was actually chief engineer at Roland R&D Los Angeles for a few years. And I'm the one who kind of introduced audio loop-based composition to them, and it really pushed them to get into the idea of creating multimedia events, not just audio-only events. That's great. Yeah, because I think it seems like there'd be a whole, uh, especially now, there'd be a whole opportunity to, I mean, because a lot of us have a lot of tools at home too. And so being able to, I mean, I think for for instance, for multi-channel or, or, you know, not more than stereo, now that everybody's got an AirPod, AirPod Pros, <laughs> or a lot of people do, you know, there's, it's not the same, but it's, it's pretty spacious, you know, as far as what you can design and what it sounds like. Um, there's just a, an entirely different market for it. Um, and, I, and you go ahead. Yeah, the challenge is that this is still very much college industry. You're talking a lot of individual musicians who've first learned how to master this device and make music with it. Now they're learning how to set up cameras and do lighting and do switching of video. Now they're gonna have to start learning graphics and learning multi-channel. So that's why it's lagging behind professional events. Right. Next question. Next question. Thomas Bauer of Atlanta, Georgia, up next with how do you document synth music so that it can be repeated? There's different ways of doing it. There's different notations. I was co-author of a book called Patch and Tweak on Modular Synthesis, and we revived an old patch language that was coming up in the 60s or 70s of how to recreate a patch, but to generalize it so people could have modules from any manufacturer. Music notation is a whole nother field where people have been coming up with alternate notation, not just for electronic music, but orchestral works and improvised works for ages. A lot of this, you can go ahead and actually record the events as MIDI notes, for example, um, and store those and replay those back later if you want to. There's a lot of devices that can actually record control voltages and play back those control voltages later. But a lot of it, particularly these devices, which require you to manually patch sounds, you know, require a lot of your memory, maybe notes that you write down, or just, you know, knowledge of your instrument to go back and recreate a sound. Next question. Dick Brewer of Guatemala says, is there a cloud service AWS type that offers AV processing services in a modular way for concerts? Obviously slowness and redundancy must be taken into account. I'm not aware of one. A few people have tried experiments of just beaming video to another artist, having the artist treat the video and then send that out. But as you mentioned, latency becomes an issue. That's been, I mean, so, uh, one of the ways we've it's been talked about here is stacking them, and and a couple of us have done them where you you go from one artist to the other, and as long as they're that latency is perfect, <laughs> like yeah. what's coming in and what they're doing to it, and you can and you can stack it uh, going through it. But yeah, going back and forth for all artists has been a, an issue. Um, next question. Roscoe Jones wonders if Zoom OSC would fit or just just the, OSC just or just OSC there. Okay, would fit in the modern module workflow. I have no idea. Right. <laughs> yeah. Possibly for sequencing events and things like that. I mean, it's, it's there's some. Yeah, go ahead. There's some manufacturers who've actually created modules these to go ahead and control physical devices like switches, solenoids, things like that. So it's not out of the question that instead they send out commands to go ahead and switch scenes, cameras, et cetera. 
Yeah, because we we use OSC a lot. We we very rarely use OSC for what it was designed for. So it's it's used to talk to the switchers. It's used to talk to Zoom. It's used to talk to lots of other things because it's got more resolution than um, than other other protocols. And so, uh, but yeah, it'd be it'd be really interesting. For some reason, as that question came up, I was thinking about not only being able to control video, but taking the output of the music and controlling physical items in the world would be really interesting. You know, like having, I mean, it'd be weird, it'd, it'd be super weird, um, but it would be really cool, <laughs> weird in a cool way. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, exactly, exactly what I was thinking, like say, you know, you know, hey, why don't you rent a, a what do you call this Hans Zimmer's uh, wall for a day, and it'll be like you know five thousand dollars for twenty four hours, and it's all controlled by solenoids and servo motors. That would be amazing. I, for some reason, I, I just have this this thought of of uh, Chris playing and having like close up cameras on some uh, you know weird little uh, set with little things moving all the time that, that go along with the, you know, go along, but they're actually responding to the music as they're, as they're going with a little short depth of field. And it'd be really an interesting way to add something to a, uh, to a performance. You're going to say, Chris. You don't even need to, to do it through audio as an intermediary. You could actually send control voltages from these directly right. to those devices and make a part of what's sequenced. There's a few people who have made little drummer things that could be driven by these that then will drum on a flower pot or tabletop or whatever you set it up by. And how are the control voltages coming out? Like how they're, th that's what's, how does that work? Yeah, all these talk through electricity and they have, pass audio signals, but they also pass control voltages of two different types. There's a varying control voltage, usually plus or minus 10 volt range that determines how loud something is, how much a filter opens up, things like that. And then what's called a gate signal, a trigger that is an on-off logic signal to say note has started, note is on, note is now ending, you know, decay away again. So all these are interconnectable, and one of the big changes that they made in the 90s is that they made the audio signals the same voltage range as all the control signals, so it's possible to start intermingling, have audio modulate the loudness of an amplifier at audio rates and things like that. That's fairly fascinating. Courtney, you had a question? Well, one one question that you would just that just popped in my head as you were mentioning that. So did they lower the control voltage to the one volt range, or did they raise the audio voltage to 10 volts, which is quite a quite a raise. Yeah, they, they raised the uh, audio up to be the plus or minus 5 volts or plus or minus 10 volts that all the control voltages were. The early systems used line level or plus 4 dB level for their audio signals, but it made it harder to interconnect them. Now they're all running at the pretty much plus or minus 10 volt range. Next question. Jan Landy in Las Vegas is in next with, did you ever, or do you ever use apps in the synth one for an iDevice? Is there any benefit to you from a creative or instructive point of view? I have not started using an iDevice. There's people who will put on entire performances using just iOS software, et cetera. But what I have started doing is controlling virtual instruments in my computer using the sequencers and devices that are in this modular. For my own way of composing, this is my centerpiece. And then if I have a sound library, like terracotta pots being struck, it would be hard for me to synthesize. I'll just have this send a MIDI signal out to my computer and have that computer generate those sounds. What's the, what is the uh, kind of the entry level? If someone wanted to get into it, what would they get first? There's a lot of what are called semi-modular synthesizers, small boxes that you don't need to patch them to get a sound out of them. They immediately have a control panel you can start playing with and make sounds with but then they have a patch panel off to one side. So you can start experimenting with breaking yeah. the preconceived connections. Carl Moog is Mother 32. One. Yeah, Moog Mother 32 is one of the most common ones, but there's several other ones. That's a Behringer he's holding up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Behringer Neutron is a very powerful one at a very good price. And what, what, is that, what does that cost to get something like that? You can get so, into these. Yeah, go ahead. So this one, I think it's about 499 US, maybe less, mm -hmm. maybe 399 now, the current special. Um, the 32, the Mother 32, or the Behringer version of it. So 32 holes at the top, that's where the name comes from. Um, this goes for much cheaper. This is about $200. So this is a really good entry. Mono, mono synth, so it only makes one note, essentially. So it's not um, geophonic, where the other one, the red one was geophonic, it can make two notes. But yeah, so 200 to 400 entry price, uh, which is about the same price as one of the modules behind Chris. 
<laughs> yeah, these That's, are yeah. these these are not cheap. Uh, <laughs> this costs about uh, what a car would cost. What's behind me right now, and what's amazing is that this world has taken off during the pandemic, because people who are into this tend to be ones that had more discretionary income anyway. They remained employed. They didn't have as many expenses. For the manufacturers, this has been Christmas every single month since the pandemic, because people have been building up their systems and playing at home. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Chris, you, you mentioned it costs like a car. Um, what kind of car do you drive? What, do you, what are we talking? And can you get free HBO on that thing? Uh, why would I watch HBO when I have this thing? <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. You know, it, it really comes down to your tastes because you can get modules that are $69 and you can get modules that are $1,000 each just for an individual module. This system would probably cost in the realm of thirty, forty thousand to replicate. My system that I take out on gigs that fits into the airplane is about a eleven, twelve thousand dollars system, but I tend to get more expensive premium modules. It's also possible to get you know entire systems under a thousand dollars. What sets apart? What's a premium module versus a lower quality module? Um, things like signal to noise, but also accuracy. For example, a very cheap oscillator may only accurately track a keyboard for one or two octaves. A very good oscillator might keep accurate pitch across several octaves. For example. Um, some filters might distort easily when they're trying to process sounds. Others can take a very robust signal level without distorting. It comes down to quality components, quality of design, et cetera. And for the for the modular component that that Carl had up a second ago with the the neutron, what do you use the the what do you use the patches for? On the, are you patching within the system? So you're patching from one thing to the other. You can patch within the system or you can patch it to other external modules or external devices. So they're kind of like the entry level drug where it's self contained when you bring it home. You can start to modify it yourself, but then it can also patch to other systems and be expanded by systems like this. Interesting. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. I just bought one of the uh, Poly Bs, which is a Behringer, and that's about 700 bucks. Um, and it's it's kind of a copy of the mini mode and it except it has one more oscillator and it lets you use the switches to patch but it also on the back side of that you know, which you can't really see in this picture uh, there are patch input input and output points so you can manually patch around stuff and add audio signals in from the exterior side so that you can process use the processing of the filters and, and you know low frequency oscillators and the VCAs to to modify external audio as well Go ahead, Carl so the uh, the poly D, which is this one back here in the corner, um, it also has a sequencer, so you can actually sequence up to thirty two notes, which is pretty cool. Which wasn't found on the original Moog one. Um, it doesn't have MIDI out for the controls or MIDI in for the controls, so you can't really control the filter from another device. You can control notes and gate, so you can say I want an A sharp and I want it to be this long. You can do that from an external source like a computer, but you can't control the filter or the fine tune pitching, that's all done on the device itself. Um, and it does have like aftertouch, so it does have some pretty advanced features, this one here by Behringer. And, and Chris, when you do uh, trainings on this, what piece of hardware, where do you train, what hardware do people, what do you train on? You see, that, that's a very difficult challenge with modular synthesizers because there's literally tens of thousands of modules and you don't know what a student has. So I have to really take an approach of breaking things down to the concepts that this module happens to do, and then say, you know, your module may do it this way instead, and really abstract a lot of the concepts. So I do have one course, it's an introduction to modular synthesis that does start with a set of particular rolled in modules that are well matched, but then are expanded by modules from other manufacturers. And I do another course, which is very popular, that starts with the Mother 32, one of these self contained units similar to the Neutron we saw earlier with a patch panel. And a third of the course is dedicated to, and now how do you go outside the box and start patching it to other things like other modules? Right. So if a bunch of us got something like that, you, you might be interested in doing a little class is the question. That's, that, that's, <laughs> where, that, 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 that's where the question is. Is that where like, we're going with this, Alex? <laughs> you know, I, we, we have a tendency to do labs. That's all I'm saying. All right. All right. Uh, next, next, next question. Bill Thompson typing through BTRU in San Jose says, speaking of duos, Tonto's expanding headband was a crucial resource for 70s recording acts, including Stevie Wonder and Weather Report, though I don't recall if they, Malcolm and Bob, took on live performance in their heyday. Any ideas? Um, Tonto, which was the, the huge room-filling synthesizer that was that act was based around, 
was not portable. You couldn't really take it off. I think they did take it off for one live performance, but it was such a large system it was really built for a room. Um, Don't they wish that there they that there was streaming? <laughs> you know, like well, yeah, then. today, you know, obviously they could do performances there. It'd be fantastic to see like a recording session with Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next next question. Uh, George Saidi of Webster Groves, Mo Missouri. What's your feeling on Reason 11? I don't use Reason. Um, I don't use everything. So I can't really speak on that. I have decided, though, to be very hardware-oriented rather than software-oriented, just because I like the tactile nature of playing with these individual devices. There's lots of software emulations that are in the box that you can go ahead and use and they sound fantastic. They're actually more powerful than the hardware, to be completely honest. But it's an aesthetic choice of how do you want to interface with your instrument at that point. I do think that the, yeah, the analog to digital bridge is really important. I, mean, I like having a lot of things that I can touch, you know, that, that are, that are there to, it, it's, it makes it easier for me to go faster and be creative than have to analytic, like analyze how I'm going to do something as opposed to just doing it. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, but there's nothing better than flipping the rack around and re reason and watching the cables jiggle. I'm sorry, that's the best thing. <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, Chris Comfort of New York and the panel here says, uh, Chris, in a setup such as yours, how many modules are wired together to shape a single sound versus creating multiple separate sounds or parts to be played simultaneously? Yeah, part of the reason I have such a large system is I want to be able to, the goal of the system was to be able to play at least four separate parts simultaneously so they could set up four different signal paths and have like a bass a couple different melodies things like that it typically takes at least four modules roughly to build a sound an oscillator a filter an amplifier an envelope to shape those sounds but you can start adding in more things i will typically use four oscillators and a mixer to create a more complex set of harmonics i might use two different filters rather than one filter so this gives me the flexibility to keep expanding what i'm doing or modifying what i'm doing but one of the reasons I have so many modules is one, I want a playground so that I can try out different ideas, but two, so I can go ahead and perform live and have multiple instrument parts playing at the same time. Go ahead, Chris. Are the amplifier or the filter and the envelope uh, separate modules or do they ever come in the same module where you've got the, the sliders for the ADSR and then you have, uh, uh, it's also doing the signal processing itself? Yeah, combo modules are quite common. You can get them split out to be separate components, but a lot of people might put like a, a filter and an amplifier in the same module or an envelope generator and an amplifier in the same module for convenience and size, et cetera. Good, Carl. So that's a good question. So they're called synth modules. Um, Behringer's just released one in North America, so $99. Um, Roland has one that's probably a bit better quality, a little bit more range. Um, that's about $300, $400 American. But yeah, they're called synth modules. They just they lack usually the LFO and they lack usually an envelope, but they have the oscillator, they have a filter, and they have the amplifier, um, and they're fully analog. So you can get digital modules as well that do have essentially a digital module can be almost a full synth, of course, but for an analog module, um, Behringer and Roland are the two that probably have two of the best selling ones. Yeah, a few people make voice modules, and the Behringer one is actually a copy of a Roland design. Um, so you can get an entire voice in one module, and that's the way that the earliest machines did presets, is they just have a bunch of modules that are individual voices. But it's a very good point about digital. A lot of the modules in the system are digital and are capable of doing sound modeling, physical modeling, um, and can create entire voices in DSP inside the module, then convert it to normal analog control voltages to interface with all the other modules. How many people do you think are doing this in the world? Um, health, healthy five figures, it might be six figures now. Mm -hmm. And that's been hard to predict because a lot of people said, oh, it's only 10,000. Well, then a manufacturer would sell more than 10,000 one module. And you say, well, I guess it's more than that. Um, we've also been trying to figure out when peak modular is going to happen. When is this whole market <laughs> going to collapse? And a few of us have predicted it and those dates have passed and the, the market kept growing instead. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we've kind of given up on that. But it's not, you know, millions of people. It's probably, you know, low hundreds of thousands. And it's actually a bigger phenomenon in Europe even than it is in the US. Yeah, good, Carl. So Superbooth is like the module convention in Europe, in Berlin. It's actually going to happen face-to-face -face in September this year. They've actually, they missed it last year, of course, because of COVID. Um, so they have sent out invitations to people. 
Um, and that's that's a big place for the Eastern Europeans to arrive. Mm -hmm. And so you okay. literally have these one or two people companies rock up with their 10 modules, get their booth. And it's it's a very different kind of, it's getting humongous though. So Super Booth started out as like maybe five or six people really just pushing for the event six or seven years ago in Berlin. And now it's it's like a mini CES for modular synthesizers in Europe. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jan. Are you finding now that there's a shortage of digital chips so that the um, actual synthesizers that you're playing are harder to get and more expensive right now? The digital chip shortage has not affected synthesis as far as I know yet. What has been a big problem is trade wars. Components like capacitors became several times more expensive. Um, tariffs where people would manufacture circuit boards and bring them into the US for final assembly got a lot more expensive. There's been problems where plants that do analog to digital converters burn down and people suddenly have to redesign their circuit to use someone else's part. So the chip shortage you're hearing about, particularly with automotives, has not hit this market yet, but trade wars have really caused massive headaches in this market the past year. Next question. Michael Sweeney of Chicago said, what are your thoughts on current hardware synths like the Moog One or Dave Smith recent releases on the Profit or Oberheim? Um, I used to work for Dave Smith, and I'm really, really happy he's doing so well. I have a little different attitude than maybe some other people do. There's fantastic instruments like the Moog one that still do analog synthesis, what we started doing in the 60s. Personally, I have been doing analog synthesis, one or two waveforms like a square or a sawtooth, into a low-pass filter, into an amplifier, for over 40 years of my life. And personally, I want some different sounds now. I want to play in a different sandbox. And that's what attracted me to modular, is I didn't want to make the sounds I was making 40 years ago. I wanted the ability to create my own sounds that maybe I haven't heard yet. And that's the attraction of why I want this particular direction. I still own a couple of keyboards like that. I particularly like the Waldorf Iridium because it has several different algorithms inside that one box with an iPad-like touchscreen interface. But this is my real playground because I want to create something new rather than play something I've been playing for a while. Next question. Vincent Alvarez is back from Bellingham, Washington with what is a typical synth artist wear during a performance? Dressed in all black, a sequence jacket or something more like David Bowie with a Devo hat? Yeah, I have to say a disappointing number of them just wear, you know, printed t-shirts with holes in it. You know, I think they need to really up their game in terms of performance. And, <laughs> and that's been kind of the funny thing is that, you know, a lot of the people who do this are nerds and introverts. And a lot of them do hide behind their gear while they're playing. And one of the things I've been trying to say is people don't want to see your face. They want to see this face. And I actually play with my back to the audience so they can see this particular machine. And some of us make a point of trying to wear something a little bit more interesting. But a lot of it's just your person in a T-shirt who look like they you know, walked from the bar and straight to the instrument started playing. Next David Bowie spent a crazy okay. amount on clothes, so watch out. Yeah, Carl. Um, so you'll find that the women have actually stepped up their game. So women that kind of through the last year, they're on YouTube, of course, but the women have definitely stepped up their game with their presentation, their environment. They, like Even if they're just in a spare bedroom, it doesn't even look like a spare bedroom anymore. It looks like a corner of a club. Um, and they dev the women who are doing these modular kind of almost live shows or sometimes pre-recorded, but you know, premiering on YouTube, they've definitely stepped up the game and the guys kind of need to catch up because the guys, yeah, you're right, they're just kind of in their T-shirts you know, with since, you know, around four, you know, essentially sitting in a box of synths and just playing. But I think the girls have actually led the field there with actually presentation. And there's been a fantastic change in this past year as we're seeing far more um, non-white male artists doing electronic music. It was very much a nerdy thing early on. It's really expanded to people of color, people of different gender identities doing it. It's fantastic in that regard. And people have been having to up their game. I played one set in a Colorado show called October Skies, and the person after me had a smoke machine in his room that he used during the performance. Just use, just make sure to use the CO2 type. The oil <laughs> the oil gets on the electronics. You have to it's a, the more get the more expensive. If, if, if it's two hundred dollars, it's probably not something you should do every day. Uh, anyway, next question. Chris Russo, Red Hook, New York, says, "Could we get a demo of some of the different synths and sounds? Is it possible?" Not today. I've actually, I'm in between compositions. I actually was recording another training video yesterday for my patrons because I have a Patreon channel as well, Learning Modular. So this is mostly disassembled. I'm afraid I'm not really set up to do a demo right this second. But Alex keeps talking about these workshops, so who knows? Yeah, yeah I think a couple hours of that would be fun. Um, <laughs> next, next, next question. Thomas Bauer in Atlanta, Georgia. Can you talk about human input devices used, such as IR sensors and so forth? 
Yeah, a lot of people just go ahead and just directly control the knobs and switches on the front panels and modules. Um, maybe don't even use a keyboard while playing. But there are a number of different devices available, ones that are light sensing, ones that are position sensing, um, different sort of pressure sensitive ones. I like to use a set of devices called All Flesh, where you actually use your skin to close a circuit patch. So I will hold like a circuit from an oscillator in one hand and then touch the probe to my forehead to close the circuit and pass the audio. And that's been a fun theatrical way to go ahead and perform. But I do think it's an area where there's been a little bit of research in creating more interesting interfaces for these, but another area where musicians have to step up their game. They're so focused on sculpting the sound, they're not really learning how to sculpt an individual note. And I think that's an area of growth. No, no theremin. <laughs> and on days there are the theremin controllers. There are definitely theremin controllers. You see people with little antennas hanging off the side of their systems, things like that. Yeah. Go ahead, Carl. So again, Roland had um, D-Beam. They still have it in a few synths that are still available and some controllers as well. So D-Beam, you play with your hand, similar to a theremin, you, you push your hand to and far away and you could control different things. So it was a control voltage. You could control the filter, you can control the loudness, you could control the pitch. Um, and then there's other things that are essentially like the Rolly as well, which is pressure sensitive to the keys and you can slide up and down on the keys and it will change the pitch. So that's MPE, which is a different kind of format, which will include parts of um, MIDI too as well. Yeah. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, this is a bit his historical, but when I started in electronic uh, music, I studied, uh, that was the synthesizer with Model 55. And to get to... Uh, uh, one of the curious things that analog that uh, Alex was talking about, where you're flying things around in 3D, we had a turntable with four photo sensors at uh, 90 degrees each, and we'd stick a battery-operated light bulb on it, and we'd use feed those control voltages into a four-channel mixer, and as you rotated the turntable, you would fly the sounds around in 3D space on quadraphonic. So that's old school. That's great. Next question. Christian Ortiz down in South Florida says, have you streamed any of your performances live on something like Twitch or YouTube? I saw YouTube videos, but I'm asking about live specifically. Yeah, a lot of people do a lot live streaming over YouTube with a different back end. It might be OBS directly, it might be Zoom. Um, StreamYard's become very popular. And several artists and groups like out of the New York Modular Society use Twitch for streaming as well. Obviously with these folks, um, audio quality is a very big issue. And I know Alex likes to keep things running, but I have to tell a quick Zoom story. One performer does techno, mostly continuous noise beds and repetitive beats. And he tried to do a pay-per-view concert through Zoom. And Zoom said, oh, look, steady state noise, get rid of that. Repetitive noise, let's get rid of that. And basically Zoom canceled out his entire performance. Now, when was that? Stopped. <laughs> this was just a year or so ago, less than a year. Yeah. Got and someone had to say, bombed. look, yeah, uh, you know, someone had to stop him during the show, like, turn it up, turn it up, that's not working, to show how to, how, how to use original audio. And Zoom has upped their games in terms of the original audio quality. Yeah, the, the original audio quality, is, I mean, that, that happened, I think, in September, October of last year, where they just, they flipped all the, or most of the switches. The other thing that we found with synths that we had to do was put, go into computer, we would reroute it and loop back to com, into the computer input, um, where you which would bypass all of it, all the audio. Like it's just, you know, like it just bypasses all the filtering and just it gives you a raw output, um, but it's kind of hidden in, inside their screen share. <laughs> you know, like, and, and you had to kind of create it, create a, a, a specific thing for it. But yeah, I'm, I, what I was amazed at is Mickey was doing uh, Atmos testing um, with Bioral. You were just using the stereo inside of Zoom and I couldn't, what the, the, the craziest thing is hearing Feeling like I could hear things over the top of my head when I was only getting stereo was a it's an odd odd effect. Um, next question. Christian Ortiz is right back from South Florida. What are your feelings, if any, on Daft Punk announcing their breakup in 2021? Uh, yeah, everyone hates to see their favorite band, you know, say we're not gonna make any more new music. So I know a lot of people are crushed by Daft Punk. Um, I have nothing against them, but neither was I a big follower of what they did. So it didn't change my life. You know, a lot of these folks are focused on making their own music these days. So that's kind of the fun part is it's become very creative. Someone found out who they were. I think that, that, that <laughs> I spent a whole day with them, not knowing that they were they, you know, like we were working on something with them and they, and I was, they were, the creative director was sitting there telling me where he wants to shoot now. And, and about half an hour before the event went live, I realized that I was talking to them. So they're, they're, uh, they're a private crowd. 
Uh, next question. Yeah, they started as a novelty oh, act and then became big. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question. Brian Anderson here from the panel, Silver Springs, Maryland. Have you worked with PD, Pure Data? And if so, what are your favorite use cases? I have not, but I have a series of modules that can take CSound, Pure Data, um, and some are just simple. Can you, can you describe program. Uh, pure, pure Data? You want me or one of the panelists to do it? I've not worked into myself yet. Okay. Um, but pure data, C-sound, there's a number of languages that basically break down the idea of how to create sound into a simpler language to code by. Um, some people, it's typically something that's run on a normal desktop computer, but there are actually modules you can buy that can load pure data, C-sound, Arduino, et cetera, programs. And then you make it one module that's part of your system. And I've looked into getting that as like a next step down the road. I have some module ideas I want to realize, but I seem to keep getting busy with other things. It's funny how that happens. Next yeah. question. Love this one. Marty Adia says, how popular are Imogen Heap's gloves? <laughs> There's been a variety of different um, tactile glove things that went back to the 70s. Michael White's with his gloves. There was the Thunder controller for Nintendo that people adapted to control MIDI devices. Um, Imogen Heap's, they're, they're used very little, to be completely honest, but I think it's a very cool thing to make something much more expressive while you're playing. And is it, is it, it's just mostly taking those, what you're doing, it's like, a, it's just tracking your hand and, and being able to affect the, uh, whatever you want, right? You just route this, this movement is, or, or the, the positions of these hands are affecting different things. Is that, is that how, pretty much how that works? Yeah, because modular synthesizers are highly abstracted, like everything is controlled by the same control voltage. So you can literally connect anything to anything. So you make a hand gesture, say, Depending on the hand's elevation, make a higher voltage. What do you want to patch that to? Do you want to patch it to pitch? Opening up a filter to let harm more harmonics through. Do you want the sound to be louder? Do you want the sound to be more distorted? So it's not just a matter of putting on a glove and playing a synthesizer with it. It's really a matter of what do you want to do with those gestures? Next question. Jan Laddie's back with, uh, what did the Who use on their Who's Next album? Oh... I'm trying to remember if that was an ARP 2500 or one of the earliest EMS synthesizers as well. I think it was pretty much a 2500 because Pete Townsend was an ARP and Dorsey and had a lot of the instruments. And some of the most famous parts were at not actually strictly synthesizer, but passing organ through a synthesizer to process it. Next question. Bill Thompson is back with our last one in the queue from, uh, and he says in the nineties, there was body synth and Laurie Anderson and others have used sensor based body suits and so forth. Aren't we due for a renaissance of non-traditional gesture controllers beyond Mimu gloves and the like, remember the Cyberbeat brothers uh, do for. Yeah, I really think it is an, an area for expansion because a lot of this is about performance and putting on a cool visual show. I think it's just a matter of a learning curve right now. You know, these are not something that you immediately start using. They take a bit of time to master. And I think we're in an interesting world that's still evolving with these musicians. They're still learning and adding to their skill set. This past year, they had they had to add video production and streaming to their skill set. And I'm hoping that we can start adding more gestural performance to make our performances even more interesting. Do you think that 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 there is a, a space for them to take notes from DJs? You know, DJs do something that is not particularly visual, um, and, but you end up with you know these huge performances with lights and and um, you know visuals that go with the music that they're building. Yeah, quite often you're seeing people bring projectors and things like that to these concerts to make the visuals more interesting. And by the way, DJs have started adopting modular synthesizers to make their own sets more visually interesting as well. Yeah, uh, Jen sampling interface with 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 your systems because i know a lot of the djs are using sampling how is how does it interface with uh with your synthesizers yeah there's a lot of sampling based modules in available these days and i have a few of them inside this system and you can either use them to pre-record sounds and play them back on command um, i will do that quite often with drum loops speech snippets and things like that but a lot of people are also doing live sampling. Well, they'll go ahead and take a stream of audio into a module. It's using a granular synthesis algorithm where they can go ahead and break the sound up into chunks, multiple chunks, layer them, reverse them, repitch them. And using that live sampling and sound manipulation as part of the performance. Good, uh, Carl. So there was um, a whole wave at the end of the 90s, early 2000s of 
synth DJs. So essentially they made the music on the spot live using some modular, some keyboard, just a whole range and maybe some rack synths as well. So Junkie XL was one of these. He's famous for doing the, the Batman movies, composing Batman movies, Mad Max. So he's moved away from doing that kind of setup. But we are seeing that slowly come back, but not to the size that Junkie XL was doing shows to 200,000 people. So we're not seeing that come back just yet. And how much, how much is it for Chris that you do live? I mean, like, I mean, you, you plan it all live, but like when you're fiddling with things, is there much to watch? Is it, is it, do you feel like it's, it's, you have, it takes a long time to get there. You're building this piece and then that piece and then something else. It really depends on the particular piece. Quite often when I'm having to do these more complex orchestrations where there's several things going at once, a lot of it is me entering the score into the instrument ahead of time and then doing gestures and tweaks. So I'm much more of a conductor than a performer while playing, saying, okay, you louder, you with more vigor, you thin out what you're doing by manually changing controls on the machine. But a lot of it is also just like launch this section, launch this section, just for the pure realities of how do I play multiple music parts as one person live. Other people make it very theatrical in terms of having just one repetitive line and then just really altering the sound with very physical you know, knob tweaks to hear, look, I'm making the sound change its tone. <laughs> well, and that's where the theremin could be kind of interesting if you get good at it, you know, being able to kind of pull things in and create that kind of organic uh, process. we got a couple more questions that rolled in right at the very end here. Right. Brian Anderson's in from Silver Springs, but I know you're a hardware guy, but what's your take on NI's reactor? I haven't used it. And that's not because it's bad. It's, you know, there's lots of fantastic so, um, software-based modular-like or full modular sense. There's a freeware one called um, um, VCV Rack that a lot of people use. There's a big community around that and people coding their own modules to add to it. It's another way of working. And if you're more comfortable with a glass interface and a computer screen, which I was personally in a good portion of the 90s, it's a fantastic way to go. I just hit a point in my life where I said, what made me happy? And I said, it was mucking with sound. So I decided to take this route to get back to that part of my life. Next question. Chris Comfort in New York, back with which of your modules would you consider the most complex and or powerful and why? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, here, that's, that's the funny thing is some people will get a module that's digital based, can be a chameleon and can do anything is very powerful. Part of the reason why I've gone this approach is I prefer modules that are very flat, that have specific things they do and bring all the UI out to knobs. So I don't necessarily have an individual module that's particularly powerful. I've made a point of having modules that are very immediate to use and then I'll patch multiple modules together. Other people will get modules, um, mutable instruments makes a lot of great ones like Platts. Um, there's companies ER101, 301, et cetera. They're very programmable with a large LCD screen. You can program them to do a variety of things. That's another way of creating music. I just have kind of like democratized the system to where everyone's flat and makes a small contribution and I have to patch multiple ones together. Probably the biggest contributor is just outside of camera down here is my sequencer. It's a company called 512 here in Albuquerque. It makes a vector sequencer. And that's the center of my system. It's very, very powerful in terms of not just playing back a score I put into it, but having chance operations and doing automatic modifications like transposing things on command or based on a pre determined schema, et cetera. That's probably for me, the most powerful thing because that allows me to conduct the rest of the system. It's funny, I, I see a parallel with you using hardware. I use hardware for live streams instead of all the software. And part of that is because I wanna have the modularity of being able to repatch things and, and, and build things out that, you know, that are hard to do in a, in a software environment. Uh, we're going, we're running out of time. We're gonna go one more, we got two more questions on, on the, uh, in there, go ahead, next question. Mickey, uh, here on the panel from the Philippines, there seems to be a lot of big electronic acts that have come out of France. Any theories on why there are so many talented French artists and why they've had such good success? Well, in general, it's a lot of European countries like France are more supportive of the arts. There's countries like Ireland that will actually give a stipend to artists to be artists rather than having to find a job and do this in their spare time. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing more artists come out of Berlin in particular, in addition to France, because those governments support people who are dedicating their lives to being artists. A lot of people are doing it in the US, either have to do it as a side gig in their spare time, or be that top of that iceberg sticking out where they actually have managed to make a living doing it. Next question. Jan Landy, Las Vegas, when performing live, how many keyboards do you use and which keyboards do you prefer to control the synths? <laughs> 
you know, someone laughed at every performance I saw me play on this thing, I had a different keyboard controller on it. And it was just a matter of like how much space I had and what mood I was in that day. I'll typically have, and you'll see this on my set Saturday on part of SoundQuest Fest, two particular keyboards. One keyboard to go ahead and play live leads and another keyboard on the other side of the room that I would go across to, to load notes into to play arpeggios. And then the rest of it was, was programmed on the modular to go ahead and run. Uh, Next to question. follow up, to follow up uh, on that, uh, how many keys are on, or how many octaves are the keyboards? It can be anywhere from one to, um, I have a seven octave controller as well. Last question. Andy Liptick, uh, San Francisco. Do you ever use analog guitar pedals or vintage analog outboard rack gear to process your synth modules? Guitar pedals have become a very popular thing to add onto these because, again, they give you direct manipulation. And rather than being on the floor, they're up on the table on the same level of these so people can man manipulate it. Some people use just pedals and use pedals as modules to go ahead and process sound. So that is a very, very big thing. And some people will still use old rack-based gear, old reverbs, um, Eventide H3000 Ultra Harmonizer is a very popular device as well as device. I've been personally going in a direction where I'm putting in more of my effects in the modular so I can control my effects as part of this ecosystem. And I will actually have sends from my mixing board to effects inside the modular then back to the mixing board again. Now, where can people find, uh, I, I have, I have a, a, one more image. Uh, this is your, this is your uh, website? Yes. That's my hub where, in addition to talking about the courses I do, I have a modular synthesis glossary up there, description of the book that I co-wrote with Kim Bjorn a few years ago, um, and a little bit of history by myself. So learningmodular.com is like my hub site. And also you'll see a link along the top to Alias Zone, which is my music persona. That's great. And then tomorrow we have the, uh, the fest begins. Yes, this is, a, this is a big thing. This is a lot of... a musicians who are very established in this genre as opposed to people who have come up recently. And this is going to be a real landmark event in terms of being very professionally produced. They've done it on a couple of servers, redundant backup, everything timed out. Um, it's going to be a lovely event. It's kind of like hitting the peak of where we've been this past year with the pandemic and electronic musicians trying to adapt to our new reality. Do you think that this is going to be something that, uh, uh, that we is going to move the, the, this industry much more online than it was before? I mean, do you think that's a permanent move? I think it is. Because before, if you wanted to see someone like Steve Roach or Robert Rich play, you'd have to wait for them to go out physically once every year or two and find the small venue in Tucson or Santa Fe that they happen to be playing. Uh, so it was very hard to see this music live. Now that people like Steve Roach has had a, a taste of, I can do this monthly from my own studio without having to load up all this gear and moving it, they're becoming much more visible and doing it more online. So it, it's really going to help raise this little subgenre to the surface and make it much more visible. Chris, thanks so much for stopping by. So, so thanks good for to having have me. You. Yeah. Yeah, it was it, just just amazing. So I'm, it's it, it, modular is something that I have I wanted to get into for most of my life, and I just haven't really. And, and when I saw that you're into it, I was like, oh, I might have to actually go down that path. Um, it, it's I, an expensive black hole. Yeah, I mean, I had a, uh, you know, the, the closest I got, not modular, but the closest I got was, ha you know, I did a lot of stuff when I was DJing uh, with uh, an Emu Emacs where I was just doing lots of samples and lots of process and I would add it to what I was doing and, and use it for shows and, and stuff like that. And so it was, and it was just, I could literally sit there for hours playing, like just, just yeah. in a weird way, not, like not, not playing, playing, but just yeah. playing with the music. It's, it's a mindset thing. If you're a type of artist who's scared of a blank canvas, um, these are not for you. <laughs> if you're the type of person who sees a blank canvas as an invitation, these right. are fantastic. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And we're, I, I know a bunch of us are going to watch it. What time is your, is your gig on, uh, on Saturday? My set Saturday is, I believe, at 540 Pacific um, Daylight Time. If you go to the website, soundquestfest.live, um, and scroll down, they made it very much a one-page layout. They have things you can open up, not only to see the schedule, but also um, bios in each of the artists, et cetera. Great. Fantastic. I'm going to definitely check it out. Uh, Carl, thanks for coming uh, and hanging out with us. I think this is your first time. Did, did Chris uh, attract you to, to jump on? Yeah, so I've been mm -hmm. watching. Um, so just to let you know, I've been watching for probably since January. So on YouTube. Right. Um, so I, I'm, so as you can see, I do have, so I have digital ones as well. So there's a few side digital, um, hybrid. We didn't talk anything about hybrid. And then these are fully analog ones. That's great. These ones here and the ones I held up. But yeah, I've been watching since January. I've been following, you know, Mac breaks since 
Scott Bourne talked make, about making a vest out of mm. iPhones. But um, but yes, but definitely I thought I've got something to contribute with this one, and that's the whole point. So I can't, you know, I, I don't want to be the main speaker, of course, but I want to just be a little bit contributor and say that there is a whole YouTube Live kind of thing now happening right. in the last year, and it is happening. Yeah. Um, there's Gaz Williams in in the UK. He does a show every Wednesday night. He has he he taught himself how to use an ATEM. Um, he bought right. both the ATEM and the Roland, and he did a review saying which one's better for him. And he ditched the mm. Roland and used the ATEM. Um, he now has black magic cameras. So yeah. he is some he is someone who's actually just done it himself through grip because he can't perform anywhere else. Yeah. So he was That's a bass player and he's just gone into Eurorack. So yeah, but there is a whole community out there that is looking at doing these live and live switching. Very important that they can show the rack, show what they're plugging, and then come back themselves. So that whole life switching too. Yeah, there's a and there's a, a bunch of artists that that are either DJs or you know doing some of the stuff that have, have just really taken the live thing to a, a pretty amazing level. So I think that I think we're going to see you know a lot more of it. It seems like it's a, it's the kind of thing where you have people who are thinkers doing this. So I mean that's this is not the you know this is a thinker techie kind of. Uh, community, it seems like the kind of thing that they would take to once they once the videos start going, it seems like it, it's the mindset is pretty um, is the right group to to take it a long way. So yeah, all right, thanks and thank thank you to to I, at the beginning I was a little worried. I, we had Chris here and I was like I was excited. There weren't a lot of questions, and then of course everybody filled in. They got all the questions in here. They kept the show going. So well done to the audience uh, who kept our who always keeps our show moving forward. Um, and thanks to the panelists for another yet. One more great day, the first day of our second year. Um, and so uh, it's really, really great to hang out with everybody here every day. And we're going to go into the post show. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody else. Thank you. We'll, Take care, uh, everyone. All right. See ya.